um, hello good afternoon everyone so we welcome you all to the plenary session 5 of 21st national space science symposium this session named enabling technology for space exploration is chaired by dr n raghu and uh, dr m durga rao so uh, as of now uh, people already know but i will just like to make a note of caution that uh, if the speaker gets a pop up message on their screen speaking attendee is requesting a control so please deny the request or simply ignore and i will also request the attendees to not to click on the request control button at any point of time so now over to you dr n raghu and uh, uh, dr m durga rao thank you thank you madam uh, for this instructions and guidelines before we begin the session so now it is uh, 2 pm so we are supposed to start a sessions and i understand that uh, the speaker is also available and uh, the first speaker i mean and i see that uh, two more speakers uh, uh, that is uh, gatul shubham as well as a mithun also available in the uh, presenters list so and uh, uh, so dr durga rao uh, will be co-chairing the sessions uh, along with me so dr durga rao shall we start the session Okay. Uh, we can invite. We will go with the uh, first presentation. I can uh, introduce. Okay. Okay. So uh, we have uh, day four session A PS five today the the February third. So the session is actually two hours uh, session from two to four, and we have all together eight uh, presentations. And uh, out of these eight, we have one invited talk from Dr. P. Ganesh. Uh, he is from Isro uh, Propulsion Complex, uh, Mahendra Giri, and uh, followed by three more for plus uh, uh, that is a poster kind of things. Then after that, we have uh, three more. Uh, Twenty uh, minutes presentations each, so we'll start the sessions. And uh, again, I welcome all the presenters as well as the audience to have uh, been in these uh, sessions. And uh, before uh, uh, the presentation starts, I take the opportunity to introduce the invited speaker, Dr. P. Ganesh. So, who is the, the at present deputy director, Propellant Fluid Systems Integrated Cryonic Engines and uh, Stage the specialty is raw propulsion complex IPRC main degree. So Dr. Gones has done M Tech in chemical engineering from IIT Madras, and he did his PhD in process systems engineering from Max Planck Institute Germany. He also has done space studies program that is SSP 19 from International Space University France. So while being in uh, service, so coming to his professional experience, Dr. Gones uh, has. Has a wide working experience. He has already established, contributed to ISRO by establishing a propulsion research laboratory in BSSC for the subscale injector characterization for cryogenic and semi cryogenic engines. So he also has worked on the design and testing of the hydrogen peroxide based monopropellant thrusters. And currently, he is working in the establishment of integrated cryogenic engines and stays their specialty at IPRC Mandragiri. He also has a research interest. In the development of uh, in situ propellant uh, utilization technology for interplanetary mission, considering Moon and Mars exploration, that he will be talking about today for another 45 minutes. And he also has contributed in terms of publications, more than 10 publications, peer-reviewed journals, and 20 more than 20 publications in the national and international conference. So it is our uh, actually pleasure and privilege to have Dr. P. Ganesh. Uh, on board today in these sessions, and we are very eager to listen to his talk on in situ resource utilization for Mars and the Moon missions. So over to you, Dr. Ganesh. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Raghu, uh, for the kind introduction, and thank you, uh, organizing committee, for the for providing the opportunity to present uh, our work and especially our new developmental work, which is focusing on. Uh, Another decades, so that is. Uh, thank you very much for the organizing committee to give the opportunity to us, and uh, let us uh, go through the presentation. So let me share the presentation. So, uh, so are you getting my presentation? I will switch off the video. I'll. Uh, so yes, yes. Presentation uh, is in the Ganesh. Yeah. So 
so thank you so the another i'll i'll make the presentation for another 30 to 40 minutes so we'll keep another last 5 minutes if any question is there so that way i made the presentation and we'll keep some cushion uh, and it is the topic is already as introduced by ragu this will be a very interesting topic which has been lost 15 years around the world around the globe all space fair nation is working on this particular topic that is called the in situ research utilization for moon and mars so the why this uh, in situ research is uh, utilization that is called isru has uh, come into last 15 20 years as a very prominent uh, technology which has to be investigated further for the maturity level uh, the only reason is uh, in future the people are expecting the robotic or human exploration or human settlement in uh, moon or mars the long term settlement or long term visit to the mars and moon so that is the ultimate aim so it towards this ultimate aim to achieve it this will be the one of the technology which will if it is matured then definitely it can help the mission point of view that is what the people around the world and universities and the us nasa european space agency you can say that all over the people are working around this particular topic so maybe we will go with the introduction on uh, institute research utilization so then we'll go on keep on to the topic a little bit more on uh, technical content so what exactly the what is uh, isru that is in situ research utilization uh, that is uh, nothing but uh, any hardware or operation that harness or utilize that that means you can utilize or you can resource whatever available in the other planets you can able to get it and then utilize it that is called the in situ and to create the useful products and services that will support your missions robotic or human exploration that was the definition which has been widely followed for the isru that is uh, that is everybody this the name itself will clearly implicate what is exactly this isru so what exactly the resource what we can uh, expect from the other planets especially moon and mars so water sometimes in mars we have the gases atmospheric gases volatiles metals and alloys and sunlight sunlight is a major energy source which is available in the resource so what exactly meaning of the isru means there is a three major elements which is isru which is coming into picture one is the resource assessment that means what are the resources available at the moon and mars or other interplanetary that is called the assessment and the mapping and you have to do the geology and how the terrain condition is there those are the things are called the resource assessment the next part the element will be the acquisition so how one can do the acquisition of this resource either if it is the atmospheric gas then how you will going to collect those gases and if you want to get the regolith then how you are going to excavate or drilling it and how you are going to transfer to what is the expected plant or expected process you have to transfer it and any pre processing is required to before going to the processes so that is called the resource acquisition and the final part element will be the resource processing and the production that is a consumable production so whatever you acquired a resource we have to convert it into a useful products mainly on the propellants so propellants means for your return mission or your support for the energy for the moon and mars you need the propellants so that propellants you have to produce it and the support gases life support gases means basically oxygen and nitrogen so these two gases how one can produce it using the resources from the moon and mars and additionally that the feed stack for manufacturing because we have to go the go for the moon and mars with autonomous mind of thinking so you should have the autonomous and you should not be depend on the earth for any of the any manufacturing like small small things if you want to manufacture it, you have to get a feed stack out of the resource available in the moon and mars that's what this is i sorry the major three elements so uh, so what is uh, the difference is that uh, Uh, I sorry is the classical of so make it versus bring it. So what is the meaning is that uh, if you want to go to moon and Mars, whatever things what is required for your mission, robotic or human exploration, you have to bring it with yourself. That means uh, all propellant for the return mission, life support system, any other etc. etc. Those all those things you have to bring it from your from Earth itself. That is called the bring it is a concept. Make it is the things. try to avoid bringing the more material or more uh, propellants or more life support system from the earth try to make it at the moon surface or mars surface that is the difference between the make it as a okay, bring it the conceptual or uh, historical point of view bring it when you take apollo mission lunar uh, model apollo mission the, everything has been taken from here so it is nothing has been uh, produced or nothing has been resource has been used except the energy the energy from the sunlight for the solar panel only it has been used the remaining resources are not used at the apollo mission that is a concept of uh, the bringing it bring it to the nature and future will be like uh, human missions it will be more on the make it as a mission 
so that will help in increase your mission performance because especially in mission performance when you talk about when you bring it in the mission it's a concept you have to carry the most of the payloads or materials chemicals propellants life support gases that means your lander size and the launch mass to the low earth orbit will keep on increase based on your requirement so if you have the make it a concept your mission performance you can have a lot of saving on the launch mass saving and the lander size there will be reduction and another thing is the major point is the increases in the sustainability so you are sustainability in the other planets it's not depend on the earth so it's you had independent sustainability you can able at you can able to make it achieve in the moon and mars like enables a life supports and the habitats so that is the increasing in the sustainability mission risk mission risk means you guys here since you have the self sufficiency in terms of make it concept in other planets you have the mission risk will be completely reduced by meaning of self efficiency and earth independent also it's completely you are going to avoid it maybe especially on the supplying of the propellants and other gases so other major thing is the science and technology developments so obviously this all those things are it has been towards to the achieving the technology or science advancement by doing the some innovations and the hard is we are going to derive out from the spin off which will be used for the many other technology because especially when the space technology has emerged in 19 late 1950s the technology has been given into the many of the spin off to the other industries the so similar way whatever you are investigating into the technology definitely will have the spin off to the other things so that anyway we will discuss in discuss in detail in the upcoming slides so that is what the concept of a classical approach taking everything with you towards to the philosophy of living of the land that is what the future direction which the, almost all the space faring nation is going working on it especially to achieve the technology of the in situ research utilization so okay so the in situ research utilization so i am not going about to the talk about the complete isru because that is a very big topic on this particular domain i will focus little bit little bit more focus on what exactly we are doing and we are exactly doing it and the current research especially system analysis and what we are doing it that is focus on more on the propellant production so the propellant production is the one which is the primary one which will uh, save the lot of savings in the la launch mass and uh, uh, launch of the low earth orbit and especially the mission point of view so that will be the producing the propellants propellants means you need the oxidizer and fuel so that can be produced from the resource available in the moon and mars so that is called the ispp in situ propellant production which is nothing but the subset of isr so isr is a very big domain so one of the subset will be the ispp so that will be the most interesting and the most promising technology which we can able to achieve in a very quick if you are investigating and innovation concept if you are introducing definitely it is possible in a very near future so that's what the most of the research is currently going on especially on the propellant production and there are many viable processes you can able to see it, but anyway i am coming to the each one so you have to evaluate to the technology which is the readiness of the technology what we are standing out and what exactly we have to do it, do it to achieve the technology readiness in terms of mission point of view and we have to select the one promising and then we have to advance to the technology readiness this is what the ispp what exactly we are looking into it so well that's a simple case study so i have put this simple case study as a mars mission so if you have your yes. mars uh, yes ganesh sir uh, this yep. is sorry to interrupt you uh, actually sir. your ppt slide uh, is not visible sir ppt slide everybody is uh, having issue or yeah i am also not able to see dr ganesh ppt is not seen now let us wait it is coming yeah. up yeah now yeah. it is okay so okay now the even more slide movement is coming no, can, can you change sir now it is in uh, yeah now it is changed now it is changed okay okay so but we okay okay uh, maybe sometimes it has uh, disturbed okay. now it is clear the slides are yeah, yeah. it's clear it's clear yeah, yeah thank you very much thank you for the information because otherwise i will not i may not may knowing about the slides are visible or not okay thank you so just as a case study for the mars mission i just make it as a one simple case study so what exactly if you have a mars mission production of the oxygen or production of the oxygen methane if you have the technology which is in situ propellant production which is available on the mars and in one hand another hand if you don't have the technology for the isru and if you are planning a mission to the mars so what is the major drawbacks and what is the major advantage with the 
ISRE, what you are going to get is only, I am putting it in the slide. So the major resource available in the mass is the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and moisture from the regolith. And the process which we are going to discuss in detail in the upcoming slide will be the production of the oxygen and methane. That is the one process. If you have the production capability with the resources available in the mass, you can be able to save the every one kg if you are made it in the mass. You can save the launch of 7.4 to 11.5 kg launch into the lower target in the air target. So that is the savings you can able to achieve it in terms of the ISRU technology put it into the mass. So that is what I want to emphasize on the technology which is really needed for the, especially for the mass mission. So this will be the start with my introduction um, with the in-situ propellant production. So that is one only I'm going to talk about more on this particular talk as part of the ISRU, the technology which is needed for living of the land needed for the long-term strategy of the human exploration or robotic exploration. And this will provide the basis for the long-term plan of ISRO's interplanetary mission because this particular study, we detailed study, we made it and then we made a detailed long-term plan what is exactly our ISRO's interplanetary exploration direction. And our objective is to demonstrate, design and demonstrate the particular ISPP technology uh, which is addressing to the moon and Mars to advance the mission plan. So as a prototype technology, we want to demonstrate it in the ground level. And this will help in our presence in the international collaboration, especially interplanetary mission, achieving the technology advancement because we are also part of the maturing the technology. And this will be definitely, it will be a boost for the space interest to those who are interested in the space. It definitely will give the innovation and sustainability in the space. space. And finally, it will be a spin up. So with that, we'll move on to the uh, I hope the slides are moving it. So the slides are sitting out. Uh, yes, sir. yes, okay. So we'll start with the moon and Mars and asteroid and other news as we did. I'm not going to talk about anything on asteroid and anything on other things. I'm going to talk about only on the propellant because the time is very only the 30, 40 minutes. So I'm interested to on only to the propellant production in the moon and Mars. So if you take the resources, because when before anything, if you want to talk about any production or any anything, if you want to synthesis uh, thing. The first thing, if you have to come into mind, what are the resources available at the planets, other moon and Mars? So with the moon and Mars, if you take the major resource, many things I have listed here, but the major research which is addressing to the production of the propellant, which will be the one will be the moon with the, there is a water, ice regolith in the polar regions. That is everybody knows it. That is the one water is available in the moon and the polar region. And the hydrated soils also, there are many missions in the Mars, which has been telling as a confirmation on some so four to seven percentage of water is available in the hydrated soils or regolith of the Mars. So that is the two sources. And another source for the oxygen at the moon will be the moon soil or moon regolith, which is the 45 percentage of the oxygen content is available in the moon soil. Anyway, that illuminate or anything I will discuss in the next upcoming slide. Then Mars, it will be the oxygen in terms of carbon dioxide in atmosphere of the Mars. It will be having a 96 percentage atmosphere. So these two resources only we are going to talk about in much detail how one can convert these resources into the useful propellants for our return, uh, for our uh, propellant return missions. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So other things I'm not going to touch much because uh, the time is very less. So let us stop, uh, start with the stepping stone as a stepping stone to Mars because everybody in the world in uh, NASA, ESA and uh, uh, European Space Agency, JAXA, everybody is thinking about uh, say, uh, lunar in-situ propellant production as the stepping stone to the Mars uh, ISR because so whatever the uncertainty you can expect in Mars, that can be simulated in the lunar because autonomous uh, propellant production, settlement, human settlement. That's why lunar, they are keeping it as a stepping stone to go to the Mars. So that way, that's why I'm talking about first on the lunar, then continues to the Mars. So the lunar ISPP, that is the in-situ propellant technology, before going into that, so uh, as I said in the beginning, um, lunar atmosphere, lunar regolith, that is having an oxygen will be combined as a metal oxides. The metal oxides in terms of uh, uh, iron, titanium, calcium, silicon, aluminium, magnesium, these are the things which has been combined as uh, oxygen and the metal oxides it is available. As an outcome, if you see it, there will be a percentage, percentage wise, there will be a 45 percentage of oxygen will be there in the metal oxides. So you have a different variety of the regolith or lunar soil with the mayor, highland and the, the sun and average. So if you take most of the things will be like a silicon oxide forty-five percent percentage. And if you take it out to the oxygen alone from this metal oxide, it will be coming around the 45 percentage. And temperature range in the lunar will be like the 95 to 390 depends upon where you are sitting in the moon. And 
so this is the potential resource so when you take the lunar uh, the metal oxides will be the major resource because there is no atmosphere typically so that's what the metal oxides which is in the rhodolite is the major source which is containing more than 40% of the oxygen that is a one source and the embedded atoms in the rhodolite from the solar wind so that will be typically in terms of very ppm and the water is in the polar rhodolite and the pores of the poles that is a permanently shadowed craters near the poles so you have the water ice that is even our chandrayaan mission also has given and nasa also is now it is coming to the conclusion that there is a water ice in the poles and uh, from these resources what is the possible option of uh, propellants which can produce from the moon one is the major thing oxygen because straight away if you take the metal oxides of uh, lunar rhodolite you can split the metal oxides and you can produce the oxygen that is a straight away case and uh, if water is able to extract from the pores then you can able to produce the hydrogen using the water electrolysis so split the water water into the hydrogen and the oxygen these are the two things but mostly since the ice is in the pores that will be very difficult to extract from the pores people are not concentrating on the water electrolysis especially to produce the hydrogen in the lunar mission people are more concentrating to produce the oxygen so since i already said that this lunar mission is a stepping stone rather than a permanent it is not going to help much on the mission point of view but it will be helping in the stepping stone for your mars mission so that's why people are concentrating into the producing the oxygen by extracting the rhodolite there are different process to produce the oxygen like uh, from the rhodolite you have to make a chemical reaction with the gases either hydrogen or methane and reduce that and convert it into the oxygen so the typically it will be a typical process in metallurgical industries what in our uh, metallurgy what we are going to get is metal oxide we are extracting in the earth that our useful item is the metal and the uh, oxides will be will be removed and the metal will be used for our alloys and the steel or metal industries that will be in other way in moon that metal oxides will be the same process will be investigated further and only thing oxygen will be used and other metal will be used for other purpose both the things we are going to utilize in the moon mission point of view and another e easiest process or it is a very complicated in terms of technology is the molten electrolysis we have to that anyway i am coming each and everything then pyrolysis is the another process so maybe we will go through very fast so this is a global status on this particular technology if you take if you take almost nasa european space agency and even private parties the startups are coming into the picture when you especially for the lunar in situ propellant technology the startups are coming into picture especially this uh, european space agency ohp italia so this is the one company which has been awarded for from the esa to develop the one thermochemical reactor for the oxygen production so like this there are many many people are working on this particular one and uh, this particular process as i already said there will be a chemical electrolytic or pyrolytic and water electrolysis water electrolysis we are not going to talk much because it you, it needs a water so we are going to talk about only the oxygen which can be produced either through the chemical process electrolytic process or pyrolytic process so this chemical process what is nothing but you have this lunar rhodolite is different illuminate different composition will be there the rhodolite will be melted to using the above 1600 or 700 and the current will be passed through the anode and cathode that will be splitting into the oxygen in the molten condition it will be splitting into the oxygen 
and the cathode will be there, all metals will be deposited. So that means the electrochemical process which can produce the oxygen, uh, that is having a very good yield with the 0.25 kg of oxygen with the, per kg of raw material, because here we are not going to separate the feedstock, the complete feedstock without the pre-processing can be utilized for the molten electrolysis point of view, but it is a single step process. The major drawback which is coming into picture in the molten is this anode is coming with the oxygen, there will be oxidation of the anode will be there. Because oxygen, high temperature oxygen which is coming into the anode, it will be a challenging technology which is to be mature. And another one will be the vacuum pyrolysis. Vacuum pyrolysis is the technology in which uh, uh, high, because the lunar condition is having a vacuum, ultra vacuum condition. So that ultra vacuum condition can be utilized to, to maintain a reactor in the vacuum condition. That the lunar regolith will be fed into that particular reactor and heated to the temperature above 2000 degrees Celsius. Then oxygen will be separated out from the metal oxide. That you want. Then that metal oxide, whatever oxygen separated, it will be again stored in the cryogenic cooling. So this metal oxide plus heat plus vacuum, it will be producing the oxygen. So here this this also will give the good yield and good oxygen recovery. And it is a major advantage. It's a single step process. You don't need to any pre-processing of the feedstock. You don't need to do. And the primary energy source will be the electric. Only the drawback will be like. Uh, operating temperature is slightly higher than compared to other process and they immediately we have to oxygen separate out from the conductor, from the reactor. Otherwise, again, this oxygen will be joining with the metals and join as a metal oxide. The oxygen removal once the reaction, once the 2000 degrees Celsius, it will be a rapid. Otherwise, you have again recombination of the oxygen with the metals will happen. So this is the vacuum pyrolysis, uh, the technology challenges. So with that, what we what exactly the system analysis as a case study, one particular lunar mission with the modular construct, and considering a certain thrust level of lander mission, and considering the 2000 second operation, how much propellant is required, and considering this, all these four processes have been taken into consideration, and then the comparative, qualitative, and as well as the quantitative comparative in terms of mass and the energy requirement. For the considering the 30 Earth days, and we did the analysis, and based on this theoretical analysis, if you see that each process will have yield the oxygen, but different kind of value. The lowest will be the solid oxygen, and the molten and the vacuum will give the better oxygen yield per kg of uh, regolith. And for comparing these four processes, especially these four process, we have taken the five different metrics like the technology and the steps. What is the technology readiness? Any new development? And what are the process condition, pressure and temperature, energy, feedstock, and how much efficiency and yield? These are the things we have taken into consideration, and which one will be the promising technology to advance the particular lunar ISPP. Then we compared with the metrics like uh, high, low, and moderate. So the, everywhere, wherever the green is there, it is having a efficient one, which is will be the energy efficient like that. The technology readiness high means this is a very near future we can able to achieve this technology. So already there will be a TR level two, three, something it will be there. So that will be like that means we can able to achieve the technology at the very earliest. Very low means it is will be very in the child nature. Because just only it has started this technology advancement. Uh, number of steps process means a complex means there will be a number of too many number of chemical process will be there. It will be very difficult to handle. And the one step means it's an easy process. Like that we have separated this matrix for this each process and uh, concluded that we have the Vacuum pyrolysis process, which is having a more green, which is in terms of the group the feedstock and the process condition and the single step process. So only the technology which is not a readiness is a very moderate. I cannot, I cannot say that it has been achieved. It is still in the TR2 level only. So with that, we concluded that for advancing the lunar institute propellant production technology, one of the promising will be the vacuum pyrolysis techniques. We will take forward and we will achieve this technology in the prototype model. Uh, that prototype model will be looks like this, this regolith uh, collection and this basis will be like uh, we have designed the basis as a 35 kg of per day of oxygen can be produced by the prototype model which is we are going to demonstrate in the ground uh, for the prototype demonstration. And the, my, one of the major thing is here we need the lunar soil, lunar simulant lunar regolith uh, in which ISRO has already achieved the technology to produce the simulant lunar simulant soil, that is ISRO LSS, that is only we are proposed to use to make the oxygen from the lunar regolith. This will be already started in the system engineering and maybe very soon we are able to demonstrate in the as a prototype model. So going into the Mars Institute of Propellant Production, so this will be the most interesting and challenging one. 
maybe we will we'll quickly will go so advantages of mars in situ propellant technology that already i spoke in the first slide itself it is definitely it is having a propellant mars saving for the mission to the mars so there will be a like if you have the none none means you are not going to produce anything from the mars and oxygen alone if you have oxygen alone if you can able to produce at mars or you can able to produce both the oxygen and the fuel as a methane that means you can save the propellant to 60% and 80% that is a mass which is you are going to inject into the lower orbit you have a lot of savings that is a 70% percentage weight savings you can able to achieve if the technology of the mass isvp has been matured so before going into that uh, resources in the mass so as uh, mass atmosphere everybody knows it is having a carbon dioxide rich that means a 95 above 95 percentage of the atmosphere gas will be the carbon dioxide that would be the one of the most uh, promising resource for in terms of oxygen and the soil which, which is having a water which is uh, almost 8 to 10 percentage which is under the maybe uh, below the some uh, 3 meter 4 meter level that's what it has been uh, reported so the atmosphere is uh, pressure is uh, very low pressure and the temperature is uh, average temperature is around 210 meter but we can if you expect a higher temperature in 20 degrees celsius also in the mars atmosphere so the global status if you take uh, there are there are many people are working on this i am not bringing the all of them the most prominent three only i brought here because it is the very interesting one one has been already achieved the technology in the mars surface that is called the moxi mars oxygen isr experiments so that is nothing but to produce the oxygen by collecting the carbon dioxide from the mars atmosphere split the carbon dioxide molecule into carbon monoxide and oxygen that has been already demonstrated through the latest preservation um, mars mission that's a moxi payload then other one is the which is currently under investigation by the same again with the nasa and the may famous one will be the spacex the private player which is doing the starship mission he has as part of the spacex plan to the mars mission he has uh, spacex is having a long term mission to establish a very big plant to produce the methane and oxygen using the carbon dioxide available in the mars itself so that anyway i'll coming again so this is the moxi the moxi is nothing but uh, the carbon dioxide is the source of oxygen the carbon dioxide will be electrochemically solid oxide electrolysis that is called uh, that through that you are going to split the carbon dioxide into oxygen and carbon monoxide so as part of mars 2020 mission already 5.2 grams of oxygen produced that is the greatest uh, technological achievement which has been uh, happened in uh, last year last year i think april 2021 it has been demonstrated with the 5.27 at the mars surface uh, but it has actually has been designed for uh, operating to 10 gram per hour so that is what the ultimate aim but uh, almost 5.27 gram grams they achieved the technology and uh, Sp- spacex spacex when it is coming into this is a spacex uh, plan what is the plan is you have the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and the water from the below ground so both you take it and use it as a sabatier reaction and you i am coming in detail in the next coming slide and produce the oxygen methane for your propellant emissions so let us talk about here also the same way there are n number of you have the resource carbon dioxide and water from the beneath and the sunlight as energy so you have the n number of process and the n number of propellants fermentation combination if you put many things you can able to produce it like oxygen only oxygen alone using the solid oxide electrolysis using carbon dioxide split into carbon monoxide and oxygen or you can produce a methane using the famous sabatier reaction like the carbon dioxide reaction with the hydrogen will produce the methane and water this water again will be electrolysis and feed the hydrogen and the oxygen will be produced and the hydrogen alone you can produce by using the water and carbon monoxide one of the fuel in late 90s uh, one wild thinking in the nasa's thing was why don't you use the carbon monoxide as a propellant as a mars mission point of view because the carbon monoxide easily you can produce by splitting the carbon dioxide so but it is a propulsion point of view that is not the viable because carbon monoxide is having a lot of issues as a propellant or rocket engine point of view then higher hydrocarbons like methanol and higher carbon like a propane heat butane ethane all those things can be produced by means of hydrogenation process using the carbon dioxide and the hydrogen so these are the viable process here also the same similar systematic uh, analysis of with the case study with the particular thrust so aiming out to 1000 in seconds with 100 km thrust we needed to achieve with a modular crew of four number uh, modular concept 
that we have taken into consideration and we have taken a carbon dioxide and the production rate we have considered as a 480 FTS because the mass emission it can happen in months in a, uh, the cyclic 22 months only it can happen it. So that's what it will be like a cyclic way only it can done. Just like generally cargo will be shipped to Mars first then the crew will be transferred another uh, mission. So that way only it has been planned, SpaceX also it is planning the same way only. So the propellant if you consider there will be a combination of liquid oxygen and hydrogen, liquid oxygen and methane, liquid oxygen and methanol and liquid oxygen and carbon dioxide, monoxide. Truly speaking, I'd say theoretically and conceptually, as well as technological point of view, all these propellants combination can be produced from the Mars. There's no doubt because the resource is available at the Mars. So, but the only thing is which one we want to select to advance the technology. Because all the technologies are, it is somewhat complex and it is needed as some technological advancement. But we need to achieve which one to pursue further and achieve the maturity in the technology. So for that only we made the same similar comparison of a propellant comparison methods like uh, similar to the lunar mission. So we made the logical decision on to select the process which we have to mature the technology. So like ISP is the one uh, which is very widely used for the propulsion point of view. In the rocket engine there is ISP is the one which is the higher ISP means you need the less propellant for your uh, traveling purpose or propulsion purpose. And the density of the propellant is the one and the propulsion technology because what is the level of propulsion technology which is available in the earth which is used in the launch vehicle and the energy efficiency. If you take the remaining uh, carbon monoxide, methanol and uh, higher hydrocarbon, these are the things which is there is no propulsion technology as of now it is not available. That is not viable also because these are all having a little bit of complexity especially when it is coming to the propulsion point of view. But uh, methane and the hydrogen which is well established propulsion technology is available. So methane and hydrogen because more, more than 40, 50 years, 60 years of this propulsion using the methane and hydrogen has started to technology. Even though methane is not having a flight version of the rocket engine, but it has been, the technology has been started to investigate more than 50, 60 years on the methane point of view. So if you take this uh, whole comparison logical decision, then ultimately we come into the picture of methane and the oxygen will be the more prominent, which can be the produced from the mass, it will help the mission point of view. So what exactly this methane has been, how it can be produced from the Mars is, you have the Mars atmosphere, which will be having a carbon dioxide rich. That carbon dioxide rich gas has to be acquisition and the compression because the atmosphere is having a 7 millibar pressure. We have to compress it to at least to the level of 1 bar or 1.1 bar. That will be fit into the Sabatier reactor. That Sabatier reactor will react with the hydrogen that will produce the methane and the water. So the water will be separated out and methane will be separated as a gas through the condenser and methane will be stored as a liquefaction and storage. This water again will feed into the electrolyzer and it will produce the oxygen and the hydrogen. Hydrogen will be recycled back to the reactor. But however, this to match the propulsion, because there is a mixture ratio you have to maintain between the methane and the oxygen in the rocket engine. In order to enhance the oxygen production, you need additional water for the system. That's what the water has been produced from the uh, regolith. From that uh, water will be extracted and feed into the electrolysis so that uh, you have ultimately at a steady state you can produce the oxygen and methane for the mission point of view. This is what the methane and the oxygen production with the one single two-step process like a sabatier and water vectorizer. So this is the one okay, that already I mentioned. There are many propellants potential production and we have the greater potential for the methane and the oxygen as the one of the propellant which the technology can advance the Mars mission, especially in terms of in-situ resource utilization. And this is what the basis which we want to demonstrate in the ground, the carbon dioxide acquisition. That is the most challenging one in the Mars atmosphere. You have to acquire the carbon dioxide and to feed it to the reactor. That is the most challenging one. And the reactor with the water electrolyzer. So these three red color circled, one which you want to demonstrate in the ground with the basis of methane production with 7.5 kg per day and the oxygen production with 1.8 kg per day. Which this is what ultimately we want to achieve it in the prototype model uh, for the as part of in-situ research utilization technology demonstration. So when you see the technological challenge and the gap, uh, I have put it into the three different uh, heading. One is the resource acquisition. As a beginning also, I have mentioned the same three elements, resource mapping, acquisition and uh, resource processing. Resource acquisition, if you take how to collect your carbon dioxide and without any pure carbon dioxide, separate it and feed it to the reactor. And uh, solid resource excavation acquisition and the resource you have to process it. These are the resource acquisition challenges which is not at matured 
it's still in the tr2 level or 3 level only and this is the resource processing to produce the propellant especially the heart of the total technology will be the chemical reaction so that is the carbon dioxide how you can convert to the methane so that is a sabatier reaction and the electrolysis process those are the resource processing for the propellant production and major thing which is coming to picture for the complete technology is the state of the art uh, simulation facility at the ground for isr or isp so because you have to simulate it in the ground with the mars or moon simulation chamber for testing of these all subsystems which you are going to demonstrate in the ground so these are the technological challenges and the gap and with that i came to the summary uh, this in situ research utilization especially the subset of in situ propellant production it's uh, plays a big role so in another 5 10 years it will play a big role in achieving the long term robotic and human exploration to moon and mars there is no doubt on it because this has been particularly it has been a demonstration has been demonstrated through the maxi because people are thinking it is like a fictional stories or something it is not a fictional stories it is possible to achieve because it's an already demonstrated in mars mission okay so then uh, the detailed study on this uh, potential processes for especially towards moon and mars each processes in a detailed way it has been systematically studied and then for the technology demonstration in the ground for the moon and mars exploration particular process and the particular model and basis has been identified so the technology gap also identified and for the road map on achieving the technology readiness it has been derived to achieve the or mature this particular technology with that i will thank you that entire team and this is acknowledgement to our secretary secretary we have one our director is iprc is sharing with the study team and especially our dtta headquarters guidance thank you very much thank you dr ganesh uh, it was a very actually interesting talk and uh, you have brought out so many aspects and uh, which will be used for using this in situ resource utilization for moon and mars perspectives okay it was very insightful and the presentation was very clear that uh, what process to be used or what process not not to be used the comparison metrics and all those things so just uh, uh, before we take up uh, some one two points i have one uh, this one see as you rightly told that oxygen uh, extraction from the moon is uh, from the regolith and using the vacuum pyrolysis correct <laughs> uh, for the mars is uh, from the sabatier reactions you will be extracting uh, methane and water and will be in the cycle loop correct yes sir. correct correct yes yes and if we see about this uh, moxie experiments the extraction of oxygen from the carbon dioxide using solid uh, oxide electrolysis correct. correct so what i feel is this uh, in that uh, space x experiment kind of things in the sabatier because you need hydrogen mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this uh, what is that uh, instead of uh, you know the source is carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and oxygen from the uh, regolith mars regolith kind of things so instead mm -hmm. of that if you combine these two process sabatier as well as the solid oxide electrolysis then we will be actually self sufficient with the carbon dioxide uh, that is a martian so uh, how do you actually comment okay. on this okay so uh, it will be uh, ragu uh, thank you it's a very very good question because this this point we are also debated in very in our very every session so what is exactly moxi was doing a carbon dioxide will be splitting only the oxygen uh, that will be augmenting your oxygen to your support because definitely the sabatier with the water electrolysis will produce the methane for your mission requirement but the oxygen will not be supported completely to the sabatier electrolysis okay so that instead of uh, doing that you can supplement this sub solid oxide electrolysis for the oxygen to maintain the mixture ratio for your mission because you have to maintain a mixture ratio of the methane and the oxygen that cannot be achieved exactly with the sabatier and water electrolysis alone in yes. that case you can uh, avoid the water extraction from the moon or mars soil and you can supplement this solid oxide electrolysis in place of it and you can produce the oxygen and methane for your mission point of view there is no yes. doubt that theoretically it is possible you can able to achieve but okay. only the drawback is the moxi that the solid oxide generally electrochemical processor efficiency is very very poor and uh, the continuous operation of uh, because we are talking about propellant to be produced in terms of tons okay so in the terms and production of without uh, electrochemical process achieving the technology for the another 10 years is very difficult especially solid oxide electrolysis is having a technological challenge that is the reason uh, because the water electrolysis is almost proven technology which has been done over the period of years 
So we have the technology and the subatomic reaction is having a more than 100 years. It has been the age if you take. So the technology which is we uh, people are achieving is very easy to achieve rather than going with the conjunction of solid oxide and the subatomic reaction. You yes. have the confident level will be higher and reliability of the process also will be higher when you have the water electrolysis and subatomic reaction. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ganesh, for these uh, clarifications and uh, discussions. And uh, I understand that the subatomic reactions is having a lot of uh, potential spin off application yes, also. If we yes, see sir. about the industrial carbon dioxide uh, on yes, ground, on terrestrial applications, so it will have this project will have a lot of impacts as well as the commercial aspects uh, to deal with uh, this uh, rising carbon dioxide from industrial exhaust. Okay. Yes. So uh, now I would like to take uh, one quick comment from my co-chair, uh, Dr. A.M. Durgarao. Over to you. Sir, uh, it was very nice and interesting talk uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Ganesh, sir, uh, regarding this uh, in-situ resource utilization. Sir, only one small interesting uh, only query only. Sir, mm -hmm. what are the, the theory you have proposed? What are the uh, plans you have proposed? What is the uh, condensed level and uh, when, uh, at what time? Maybe what is the uh, in nearby future? Uh, what may be the timeline or what may be the futurist, uh, uh, futuristic uh, goal? Okay, okay, okay. Maybe since it, this is a, a technical symposium, I didn't bring to that come, coming into those uh, technology things. Uh, what is exactly is this uh, uh, almost if you look into the process and the chemical reactions, these are all easily achievable uh, technology which has been demonstrated in uh, many levels. Uh, only thing is we have to address this uh, technology to qualify in terms of the space. So space worthy because of the space components is having a peculiar characteristics compared to the ground based system. So those things point only it has been need to be addressed on a particular uh, things. Okay. So that is the first thing we have to address on this particular and this uh, demonstration in the ground definitely by seeing the complete systematic analysis and this one another two years we can able to demonstrate in the technology in the ground. That is no doubt. So because definitely it is possible to achieve if you are working uh, because it is easy to achieve because this process are well known process. Because you have you are very clear about what is exactly the reaction, what exactly it can produce it. So only thing is you have to do the system engineering to make it as a very light and a compact to the system. So that is the only major thing which is needed in the especially subatomic reaction and the water electrolysis. So definitely it is possible to achieve this particular kind of things in another two to three years. Uh, but the mission point of view, it is a lot more things we have to do it. Uh, but if we are not doing our in the world, definitely the SpaceX will definitely is having an advanced stage. I can say that they can able to demonstrate in 2025 or 27. They are planning to send the Starship into the Mars. So they are having a plan, well plan of a mission of demonstrating this particular Sabatier and the, uh, water electricity for the methane and the oxygen production. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Ganesh and uh, Dr. Durga Rao for the discussions, uh, very interesting discussions. One, uh, one, two quick uh, questions from, because we are running short of time from the audience. If any one or two questions, then we'll take up then. Otherwise, we'll go to the next presentation. I think there is a small question in the chat box here from Abhijit Deepak. Yeah. Uh, okay. How are the importance of the resources decided on Mars? So that How is the... How are the importance of resources decided for Mars? Okay, the importance of resources is based on your final product. So what you are exactly aiming in the Mars. So because if, if you take me, I am thinking about to, to produce only the propellant. Okay, so that means in the for the producing the propellant, what exactly required is the raw materials and the energy. Okay, the raw material point of view, I keep it in mind that the propellants means you need oxygen and fuel. Okay, so for oxygen and fuel, the raw material resource will be some oxygen source should be there and fuel source should be there. These are the two resources. Okay, the energy point of view, there is the only thing sunlight. So that is a that is a thing. So based on the in-situ resource utilization technology, the importance of the resource will be coming to picture. For the propellant point, I need only the resource of carbon dioxide and resource. For another person, if you take the manufacturing people, let us take some 3D printing machine or metal alloys, they want to manufacture it, some metals you want to extract it. Their resource importance will be something for them, it will be different. So it depends on the specific application point of view. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ganesh. And mm -hmm. I think the, you have given a very good uh, clarifications to the questions. So now with this, uh, we'll conclude the talk and uh, let us 
uh, thank the speaker once again for this very interesting and informative talk and uh, and uh, actually in situ resource utilizations or in situ problem productions is a very emerging area and it has a lot of uh, potential applications for the space explorations so good luck to the team dr ganesh and we will let us continue this good work yeah thank you thank you very much thank you ravi sir and uh, thank you the car also and uh, yeah, indeed and Thank you. Yes, and please be with you, Dr. Ganesh, because we have uh, uh, seven more presentations down the lines, and uh, yeah. Uh, so let us go to the next. I'll, I'll yes. join. I'll join through some other meeting, huh? Because I'll join. I'll join in. Yes, uh, yes. And you may unshare this uh, screen. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yes, and so let us go to the next presentations. So next present uh, presentation is from Dr. Ananda Gota, RAD at home. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Uh, Dr. Ananda, we can hear you just for just one minute because uh, other some cross talking is going okay. on. Okay. And uh, I think LOC may please uh, unmute. Uh, okay. So uh, let us uh, welcome. The presenter, Dr. Anand Hota, and he will be talking about uh, this um, RAD at home, India, nine years of Indian citizen science research in astronomy. So it is a very quick uh, flash kind uh, of presentation. So over to you, Dr. Anand Hota. Yeah, thank you. Let me share my screen. Uh, I'm not getting the share screen option. Oh, next to the microphone, there is an arrow up is there. You have to click there. No, no, down actually there. Will be some there. Yes. Yeah, yeah, now it's coming. Okay, wait yes. a minute. Yeah. LOC, it is uh, one request is kindly mute the other people who are not presenting because uh, noise is coming. Sir, we have actually already muted all other participants. Okay, if okay, you... then it's very good. Yeah, thank you. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah, probably it is coming up. Okay. No, not that. Now it has come up. Okay. Yeah, we, we can see. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, great. I can uh, start now. <clears throat> it's a quick thing, so I have to be also quick. Okay, thank you very much, the SOC, for selecting uh, this to be presented. I'm in a kind of a wrong session. It is mostly astronomy astrophysics, but I'm putting a technology part. So I will slightly highlight that aspect also. Title of my talk is uh, Red at Home India Nine Years of Indian Citizen Science Research in Astronomy. There are various co authors including some citizen scientists and some professional astronomers from various institutes and from this network. <clears throat> so roughly, this is a packed images, but I will briefly tell you that this is the first Indian citizen science research platform in astronomy. Launched a zero-funded, zero-infrastructure nationwide inter-university collaboratory on April 15, 2013. There is a large number of people who are interested in it. There is total of 4,700 online members in the Facebook group. Out of them, 2,000, more than 2,000 are actively learning what we call RGB, red, green, blue, UV, optical, infrared, radio, image analysis, sitting in the Facebook group. There are basically 30 professional astronomers at 30 different institutes, including ICTS, TIFR, IOP, HRA, CBS, where I work, and Vigyan Prasar, Nehru Planetarium, Vigyan Samag, many organizations have supported. What they have exactly supported? They have supported the citizen science research training programs. I will go to the science part in the next slide. So at the image, you can see that the science goal is something that I will be talking next. There are various institutions that are supporting this program. What is this program? It's a nationwide trained citizen science network who are oriented to make some discoveries with the giant video telescope data. So that is how this is the only citizen science program that is India, which is looking at the Indian telescope data. Even if there are others, they are looking at the foreign telescope data actually. So we kind of organize various citizen science training program with the help of various institutes. We afterwards keep on analyzing the data 
in the social media we discuss there everybody learns from that discussion that's what is the plot that thousands of people are actively learning there we certify them after a program and that's how they grow like a trained serial scientist so we have institutions supporting in the flying pyramid model i may be the few in the leader but there are thousands who are learning this thing there are tens of institutes which are supporting it that tens of astronomers who are helping this trained serial scientist publish so this is how basically a man machine combined system has been created where this is the discoveries are happening let me go to the next one here is the astronomy part we have discussed what is going to be discovered is simply defined as students are told that discover something faint and fuzzy that the automated algorithm ai ml based algorithms will struggle in converging their algorithms to discover and characterize them that will be new because from the gmrt the tgs survey data is new and most sensitive most highest resolution lowest frequency data so when they discover something in that red green blue contour image as here then we follow up them with the gmrt that is what the if the gmrt has looked at for 5 minutes a part of the sky and we discover from there then we look for 5 hours the same part of the sky we go deep that is what here you western numbers can represent this thing that these two galaxies are merging here and the jet from relativistic plasma jet magnetized jet is seen to be only on one side what happened to the other side other side must be there but this is the relic part that is only seen here because its interaction with the ambient galaxy is medium it's making it visible so that we are detecting this fast such 60 kilo parsec long from one galaxy to another galaxy this is happening other one the galaxies agn jet or wind is actually important to convert spiral merger gas rich systems to gas devoid elliptical galaxy here again there are two elliptical galaxies you can see which are almost at the last stage of merger a tiny jet can be seen bipolar but the previous episodes outside region they have this old plasma of almost 100 kilo parsec size radio bubble is seen nowhere such bubble has been seen before so how the citizen scientists able to do it because they are looking at the faint and fuzzy structure that ai cannot handle we discover they get trained deeper and deeper they create reports and we further investigate and publish that is how the collaboratory is growing and that is how we want to make like sports the science research will become a sports everybody participates in it irrespective of their host organization irrespective of they have a degree or not irrespective of they do phd or not in this process actually everybody is getting prepared for the sky and tmt like science there are plenty of data that the satellites our indian satellites are creating that can be also incorporated in such citizen science program okay that's it thank you very much looking forward to publications and collaborations with anybody who is interested they can write to us redatomindia@gmail.com thank you very much thank you also yeah, thank you dr anandwata for this quick and very informative and it is a new information for us also probably you uh, see and good to hear that uh, your and your team is doing a very good service uh, to train people online and basically is actually is a network of uh, intellectuals yes. i can understand that and uh, is basically this kind of service is really rare okay in the today's world so probably i think this will uh, act, uh, actually be mostly benefited to the students community who are the, actually young as well as the uh, beginners okay to learn the things yes. because they don't know where to go and where to learn the things probably yeah. your service will be very helpful to them i so, was there in isor kolkata also to have this kind of a camp there are more than 150 student participated in your computer lab yes so yes that is what actually I'm telling surrounding you. also came yes yes yeah it is really good then i would like okay. to have a quick comment from my co-chair dr m durga rao after that we will move to the next presentation sir uh, yes yeah, such no comments uh, there is one uh, uh, quick uh, question i can uh, read from the chat okay so the question is from the uh, dr abhishek dipak okay so how is the correctness of the rgb image decided when a new citizen scientist contributes okay <clears throat> there are uh, two things one they themselves create images and then upload in the facebook group and discuss when they find something interesting the trained members actually discuss with that new thing upload the discussion when it is becomes access acceptable and found to be new then we have a rgb maker tool which creates those images in a standard format 
then they upload in a google form that i report a possible discovery to this thing i of course approve them yes it is a possible discovery so now you can report for the professionals to further investigate so there is always a rough edge or untrained discussion then with the group member it becomes matured and after it is matured we approve them to be submitted to the collaboratory as a possible discovery from there the professionals again discuss not the the trained citizen scientist that is how it moves hierarchically okay thank you dr anand ota i think that the answer is very clear so probably it is uh, this abhijit uh, deepak uh, will follow the link as well as may join also in the discussion so let us thank uh, the, uh, the speaker dr anand ota for this uh, quick and uh, very informative presentations thank you very and much please, and uh, please be thank with you. you in this session okay uh, till the four and it is uh, continuing we have uh, six more presentations down the line so next presentation let us welcome uh, dr jaya krishna mecca from prl uh, ahmedabad so he will be presenting on a design and development of a laboratory based microgravity experimental setup so this is also very quick and uh, fast kind of uh, presentations over to you dr jaya krishna mecca and dr anand hota may answer yes yeah already done Dr. Zaya Krishna Mecca, are you available? Uh, I think I don't see in the presenter's uh, name. So we'll go to the next presentation. So probably he may join later. So next presentation, uh, we'll let us welcome Dr. Gatul Subham Jan Kiram from IIA Bangalore. So he will be presenting on the development of spectrograph in FUB region for a possible ISRO flight. So this is also very quick presentations. Over to you, Dr. Gatul Subham. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, so my name is Shubham, and the title of my poster is Development of a Spectrograph in the Far Ultraviolet Region. Um, I hope you all have seen my poster, so I'll directly move to uh, the presentation, short presentation that I've uh, prepared. So the far ultraviolet is one of the most exciting parts of the astrophysical spectrum, uh, which ranges from 900 to 1800 Armstrongs. Uh, for it has the highest density of absorption and emission lines compared with any other part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So here in IIA, we are working on building a spectrograph in the same uh, far ultraviolet range, for which we have collaboration with the Tübingen University in Germany, and that's why we have named it as the Tübingen IIA Nebular Investigator, abbreviated as TINI. The most important scientific objectives of our instrument TINI are to do a spectral imaging of extended regions, which includes supernova remnants and planetary nebulae. Through the spectral imaging, we would we'll be able to trace the physics of the images seen by previous instruments, for example, the UVIT, through observations of emission lines. Keeping in mind our basic uh, scientific goals, we have designed the instrument in the same way. Our instrument can be divided into two parts. First is the telescope part, followed by the spectrograph. In telescope, we have a primary mirror, followed by the secondary mirror, and then the spectrograph, which includes a slit, a grating, and a microchannel plate-based detector, for which we have collaboration with the Tübingen University. Our, the design of our instrument offers us a spectral resolution of 0.8 Armstrong, which is sufficiently enough to even separate out the oxygen doublet line that falls at 1032 to 1038 Armstrongs. This is the simulated spectrum of uh, what we might be able to see once Steeny, our instrument, is in space. And uh, the spectrum belongs to the Crab Nebula for which we have uh, uh, we have obtained the data from Hopkins Ultraviolet Telescope. Uh, through TINI, our instrument, we will be able to do a spectroscopic survey of extended regions in the far ultraviolet, and we will be able to characterize the region fully. We believe that our instrument TINI will serve as a precursor to the upcoming missions like INSIST. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gatul Subham, for these very quick presentations. And we are happy to know that this development is taking place and it will open up a new uh, this uh, opportunity to such spectrograph in the far UV regions. 
So just wanted to know what is the status of this development. Is it, is this, uh, we understand that is indigenous development in collaboration with Germany, correct? Right. Sir. So what is the status of this uh, instrument? Uh, the the project has just commenced a, in in about two months ago. So we are in the preliminary stage. We have identified the vendors and we have we are working on the design of the spectral of so far. Okay. That, uh, that the other way I will ask that what is the timeline because uh, the project is one year, two years, or what is the timeline? The, the, yeah, the timeline we we have selected an ambitious uh, ambitious timeline of three years and we believe that we will be able to achieve it. Okay. Okay. Within three years, you will be developing this indigenous. Uh, instrument correct right, right yeah okay so thank you and uh, now one quick comment from the co-chair uh, dr m dogarao over to you uh, sir uh, here i want to know because a new development uh, yes. what are uh, what are your objectives and what are your goals of this project so uh, the basic objective is uh, extra uh, observation emission line spectroscopy of uh, extended objects which includes supernova remnants and planetary nebulae for which we have selected uh, the slit uh, which which will be having a long uh, uh, long slit long field of view capability and we will be able to uh, we'll be able to take spectra of an extended object in in single pointing rather than taking spectra of multiple locations in the same object and location where you want to install? Um, uh, we we are having uh, we are in a proposal stage with the ISRO for which uh, like uh, we believe that once the proposal is accepted, the ISRO will launch our instrument um, um, sometimes in 2025. Mission is yet to identify. It. Yes. Yes. Fine. Fine. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gatul Subha. Uh, and yes, uh, yes. yeah, please continue your good work and hopefully uh, by 2024, 20, 25 timelines will be able to actually come up, identify the uh, uh, missions and uh, your actual instrument will fly and uh, bring up with new uh, observations. Yes, sir, definitely. Thank you for this. Yeah, thank you. And please be with us. So now let's move to the next uh, speaker, Dr. Achilles Kumar from Benaras Hindu University. So he'll be presenting on the space exploration using artificial intelligence for human health. So, uh, Dr. Akhiles Kumar, are you available? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, then uh, just please continue uh, with your presentations. Is it visible, sir, screen? Yes, it is visible. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Akhilesh Kumar, research scholar, Department of Computer Science, Manaras University, Varanasi, UP. My topic is space exploration using artificial intelligence for human health. I will discuss the challenges of space for human health. The efficacy of currently available countermeasures is limited. Is it justifiable to, to send human astronauts to space? the case for human expansion into a space, the challenge for humanity, human-like robots in a space, conclusion. The challenges of space for human health. Long human space flights are hampered by the negative effects of the space environment on human health. This environment is difficult to broad and complex way since it is diversely impact all human system at the same time. Space radiation is one of the most difficulties. The efficacy of current available countermeasures is limited. In the constant environment of low Earth orbit, nutrition, exercise, and anti-radiation protections are only partially protective. Is it justifiable to send human astronauts to space? Human astronauts continue to outperform space robots in terms of performance and efficacy. The case for human expansion into space because of our biological limits, it's safe to assume that long-term human existence in space will require highly upgraded individuals. Human space settlement would be a unique way to ensure human survival and improve human well-being. The challenges for humanity, human-like robot in space, because of the constraints of human biology, robotics mission may be the only way to make progress in space travel. Remote areas in space that are beyond the purview of piloted spacecraft can only be reached by robotic mission, which are today the essence of space exploration. 
space robots have the advantage of being immune to determinant effect of space radiation and microgravity it is less expensive than human missions the difficulties arise in building robotics that can mimic the action of human astronauts future scenario for space exploration progress involves purely robotic missions based on autonomous and intelligent space robots and there is no doubt that effective scientific exploration of a few remote locations in space will be necessity they will highly advanced robots equipped with ai conclusion the dangers and risk of human health as well as enormous expenses make the case for existence human interplanetary missions weak human enhancement and or fully autonomous rare space robots are two possible alternatives for tackling these difficulties for a deep space missions thank you thank you sir thank you dr akhilesh kumar uh, yes. for your quick presentations and uh, we know that uh, this artificial intelligence okay though this has been inducted to space but the progress is enormous recently okay in the recent yes. time and uh, this artificial intelligence has lot of roles in human uh, health uh, while uh, uh, this for human space missions because it has to able to detect the physiology psychology okay uh, and so many things that are there for the astronauts yes. so it yes. is a very good area so please continue with your uh, good work and probably i think uh, in future you'll be coming up with more details finer details okay uh, and um, this development is really good so i would like yes. to hear very quick comment from the mycosia dr m durgarao over to you durgarao yeah. uh in the uh, one specific question to the speaker the in the human health uh, area how you are uh, going to implement this artificial intelligence it can sir sorry sir in the human health region uh, when yes. the astronauts are going or, uh, uh, to the space yes so sir your, uh, whatever you propose artificial intelligence how you are planning to implement or what is your proposal sir Before i am i am only sir i am only measuring challenges sir i am working on i am working on this field for measuring that type of things fine yes, thank you uh, dr uh, this uh, akhilesh kumar because you see sir skyno when astronauts are there in the cabin so we have to make the cabin intelligent as well as suppose in terms of this their washrooms and all those things depending upon their uh, like uh, this uh waste okay the human waste uh, their health also can be predicted using artificial intelligence so this is a very important area so yeah please be with us let us thank uh, the speaker dr akhilesh kumar so let us move to the next presenter uh, dr mithun nps from the physical research laboratory ahmedabad so he will be talking on the development of the position sensitive sub uh, meb detectors for daksa missions so uh, over to you uh, dr mithun you have uh, around 20 minutes of time for presentations and uh, please go ahead yeah, yeah thank you uh, uh, are my slides visible and uh, i am audible yes yes yeah you audible yeah. and visible yeah yeah thank you very much uh, so i'll be talking about uh, development of uh, uh, position sensitive uh, high energy detectors for the proposed mission daksha which is a collaborative effort from iid bombay prl tfr rri iuka and uh, indian space research organization So Daksha is a proposed mission to look for high energy transients with unprecedented sensitivity. So the primary goals include to look study uh, identify uh, electromagnetic counterparts to gravitational wave sources as well as to detect classical GRVs as well as to characterize and understand uh, the physics behind these uh, sources. So this is planned to be achieved by using two satellites uh, which provides us all sky coverage. Uh, and it it will include a suite of instruments uh, covering three detectors which will allow us to have a wide spectral range from 1 kV all the way up to 1 MeV and uh, with its high effective area uh, it will have very high sensitivity over all sky uh, as uh, and it is it will be the highest sensitivity as compared to the uh, currently operating GRB missions such as swift or uh, fermi uh, it also uh, it is also emphasized that uh, we will be able to provide real time alerts uh, for the detections on board so that ground based observatories can do a quick follow up uh, to look for afterglows and uh, other aspects uh, of this uh, sources to hear more about uh, the mission uh, and uh, the science goals uh, please listen to the talk uh, which was delivered by varun on the first day of the symposium which should be available in the youtube channel so the present configuration of uh, daksha is something like this uh, where we have uh, detectors arranged in a, a hemispherical for, form uh, to have a wide uh, coverage over the sky uh, there are three kinds of detectors 
the first set of detectors uh, will cover the low energy band from 1 kV to 30 kV, where we plan to use silicon drift detectors, uh, array of silicon drift detectors, which will be built based on the heritage that we have uh, from flying similar detectors on the successfully operating uh, XSM instrument on Chandrayaan-2 and the instrument uh, for the APXS for the Chandrayaan-3 uh, rover. The workhorse of the Dextra mission uh, would be the medium energy range, uh, array of CCT detectors uh, operating in the 20 to 200 kV energy range, which will be pixelated CCT detectors similar to what is flown on the AstroSat CCT imager. To hear more about the development of this, uh, you can see the poster by Sri Harsh uh, in the same session. And to cover the high energy band uh, from 100 kV to 1 MeV, uh, we plan to use the baseline requirement is to have a scintillator detector, uh, which is similar to what is the veto-like uh, veto scintillator veto detector, which was flown on the uh, AstroSat, uh, which is a scintillator read out by uh, silicon PMs. Now, let us see uh, what else can be done with Daksha uh, apart from looking at the transients. So uh, the Dakshah is now going to observe the all sky uh, when it is up uh, for uh, about up to uh, energies of 1 MeV over several years. So in addition to the transients that we discussed about like electromagnetic counterparts to gravitational wave sources or GRBs or other transients, there are also high energy sources which are persistent such as pulsars, AGNs and black hole binary systems. So uh, however, in the uh, there is not much data available of these sources in the energy range from a few hundreds of KVs to a few MeVs, mainly because the previous surveys, very sensitive surveys such as the swift bud surveys, ends at 150 KV, and that uh, at very high energies, which is about 220 MeV, is available with Fermilat. So there is some uh, gap where we have some opportunity to uh, look for sources as well as to characterize their spectra in the sub MeV range from few hundred KV to about one MeV. But to be able to do this, the instruments should have some imaging capability. Now. In case of Daksha configuration, this can be actually achieved by using a technique called Compton imaging. Here, what happens is that uh, X-rays coming from a source will undergo Compton scattering in one layer of the detector, and will the scattered photon will get absorbed in the uh, bottom layer of the detector. If uh, suppose we have the position information or on the interaction in the uh, both the detectors as well as the energy information, we can. Uh, hello, I think. Uh, no, we are able to hear you. Only thing uh, is that... The, no, somebody has taken over the... Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Your slides, you can slide view, you can, you can keep. Uh, uh, is it gone? Uh, actually, some, uh, it went, the control went to somebody else. I don't know what happened. Yeah. Are you able to see the screen right now? Yeah, fine, fine. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, here in Compton imaging, what happens is that the uh, X-rays uh, coming from a source uh, uh, this way. So this way, if we, have, uh, if we have this information of the position as well as energy, we will be able to get uh, restrict the in, uh, uh, position of the incident photon to a cone uh, in the sky. Now, by using several such photons, we will be able to actually triangulate the position of the uh, source. So in the Daksha-like configuration, this can actually be done by using the medium energy CCT detectors, which are already pixelated, uh, which is having a position resolution of around 2.5 millimeters. Uh, and the high energy detectors, uh, which is the scintillator detector. But for this to be, uh, hello? Yeah, okay. Uh, for this to be uh, possible, uh, the high energy scintillator detector needs to be actually having uh, position sensitivity. So for to get a few degrees of uh, angular resolution, we require the high energy detector in the 100, to 100 kV to 1 MeV range to have a typical spectral resolution of about one centimeter. Now, uh, for this scintillator to be position sensitive, this is the concept uh, that we plan to use. Uh, so where we have a scintillator detector, which are read by uh, an array of optical photon detectors. So what happens is that when an incident photon, uh, X-rays uh, incident on the uh, detector, uh, it produces scintillation photons, and then the scintillation photons diffuse, and it will be detected over a range of uh, these optical photon detectors. So we see that the ones which are below will receive more more signal with the, as more number of optical photons will reach there. And now by fitting this distribution of this uh, optical photons as seen by the detectors, we will be able to triangulate the position of the incident photon. So this uh, principle is called anger camera principle and has been used in uh, medical imaging and in particle physics where the optical photon detectors are used are conventional uh, photomultiplier tubes. But the conventional photomultiplier tubes are very bulky and very large. So there is a limitation to the position resolution that can be achieved with uh, such uh, uh, instruments. 
But uh, now with the advent of uh, the new uh, uh, detectors, the optical detectors, single photon detectors called the silicon photomultipliers, it is possible to do this. So silicon photomultipliers are actually nothing but an array of avalanche photodiodes uh, which are operated in Geiger mode. So when a photon uh, interacts uh, in uh, incident on this Geiger mode APD, uh, it acts like a photon trigger switch. It will be either on or off. But the collective output from the silicon PM, which is an array of such APDs, uh, would actually provide a quasi-analog output, which is proportional to the incident photon flux. So essentially, the total current uh, would be proportional to the uh, incident uh, optical photon flux. Now, these uh, devices are available in very small size, and we require only very low operating voltages of the order of less than 30 volts uh, to use them, even with very high gain. So this is a very ideal choice uh, for the kind of detectors that we are uh, interested in making. So at PRL, we have been actually working with uh, the scintillators with silicon PM detectors from, for some time. So uh, for a Compton polarimeter that we had developed, a prototype Compton polarimeter, uh, we had actually used uh, scintillators, long scintillator detectors read out by silicon PMs as the absorber uh, in such configurations. Now the same uh, scintillator detector, if we were to actually have readout of silicon PMs from both ends by using the ratio of signals uh, received at both ends, it would actually be possible to uh, estimate the position in one dimension. Now, to extend this to two dimensions and to uh, demonstrate the proof of concept uh, of uh, two-dimensional uh, position sensitive detectors uh, using this technique, uh, we have uh, taken two sets of detectors, two configurations. In the first configuration, we have a cesium iodide scintillator, uh, which is having a scintillation decay time, or, which is typically longer, which is of the order of one microsecond. And uh, the scintillator is coupled with an uh, array SP4 SIPM, which is a four cross four uh, array of silicon photomultipliers. And the other detector configuration is where we use cerium bromide scintillator instead, which is uh, having a very fast decay time where the scintillation light is produced within a very short time of 90 nanoseconds. And it is read by an array of six cross six uh, silicon PMs, which are having, uh, which are C series silicon PMs from Sensel, which are actually having an order of magnitude uh, lower dark current as compared to uh, this uh, silicon PMs used. So uh, to read out the signal from silicon PMs, this is the block diagram of the readout system. Uh, the cathodes of the all silicon PMs are shorted together to give the bias, and it is also AC coupled to the front end board, which constrains the charge sensitive preamplifier and the shaping amplifier. And uh, based on a comparator, a trigger is generated, and uh, this trigger is used to uh, read this signal, digitize this signal using a multi channel analyzer to get the energy spectrum. So the cathode readout is actually used to measure the energy of the incident photon. While the anodes are independently connected to a, a Vertilon uh, silicon PM readout system, and this Vertilon system uh, uh, is used, to, this, this signals from individual anodes are used to determine the position of the incident photon. So here's a photograph of the experimental setup where this is the Vertilon system where the individual anodes are going. And here in this black box is the small scintillator plus uh, silicon PM. So this is a smaller size than what we actually intend to do, use for Daksha. This was a prototype development. So uh, here is the spectral performance of this uh, uh, detectors. So we have used uh, X-ray lines from americium, cadmium, and cobalt sources to estimate the spectral response of these instruments. So the left plot shows for the cesium iodide, and the right side plot shows for the cerium bromide detector. So we get a typical resolution of about 17 kV at 6 kV for uh, cesium iodide, and a better resolution of about 13 kV at 60 kV uh, for uh, cerium bromide-based uh, scintillator detector. Now, to look at the spatial, uh, how the spatial performance, spatial resolution of this instrument, we shine uh, americium 60 kV pencil beam onto these detectors and then get the individual events uh, read out uh, from all SIPMs, then uh, fit a two dimensional Gaussian to that distribution and then obtain the position. So now uh, the, on the left here, uh, the plot shows the reconstructed positions when the uh, beam was here. So you see that there is, uh, uh, you are able to get most of the photons are reconstructed to this position. This is the same for a cerium bromide. Now, the distribution of these reconstructed positions is shown uh, as a plot here, and it is fitted to obtain the spatial resolution, which is about 3 millimeter in this case, and uh, 2.5 millimeter in this case. And uh, to compare with the pixel pitch, which is the size of the silicon PMs, which we have used, uh, this is here. In both cases, it can be seen that we actually have a, uh, we are able to achieve uh, pixel resolution, spatial resolutions better than the pixel pitch. But one thing to note is that in cesium iodide, we see that there is some kind of artifacts present in the reconstructed position, which is rather not present in the case of cerium bromide. So we are able to demonstrate sub-pixel spatial resolution with this uh, detector concept. So just to see how we are able to image, 
So here is the, uh, we have actually kept a T-shaped collimator, a light collimator in front of the detector and shined it with X-rays. And here are the images by keeping the collimator at uh, X-ray images from the detector uh, by keep, keeping the collimator at uh, different orientations. Now to understand uh, the why we are seeing the systematics in the cesium uh, crystal, we actually carried out Monte Carlo simulations uh, and then uh, try to do simulations with different signal to noise ratios for the silicon PM signals. So the signal in this silicon PMs would be the optical photons reaching the silicon PM and the noise will be the dark current of the silicon PM. So we see that as you go to lower and lower silicon uh, so signal to noise ratio, so even at 3.5, we start seeing that uh, we, are, we are seeing some kind of artifacts in the reconstructed positions. So we need to have a signal to noise ratio better than uh, maybe around five so that we are able to get a reasonably uh, artifact free reconstruction in the positions. So the lessons we learn from this exercise are that fast scintillators are better because we actually have to integrate silicon PM dark light only for a short duration, which provides us better so a silicon noise, uh, SNR. Also, silicon PMs with lower dark counts are better, and we need to have a readout system which are faster so that we integrate even for shorter times, which also provides better SNR. And we have already seen that with low signal to noise ratio, we will be having artifacts in the reconstructed position. The other part, which we did not discuss in detail, is that when we go to the near the edges of the crystal, uh, there is complications arising from the reflection from the other sides. So we need to have a different position reconstruction strategy uh, when you are closer to the edges of the uh, edges of the crystal. So now, based on these lessons, now we move on to design uh, a detector for the Daksha mission. For Daksha, the scintillator requirement is that it has to have an area or the size of about 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter so that it matches the overall size of the silicon CCT detector, the medium energy CCT detector array. Now, to get an energy range uh, up to 1 MeV with appreciable efficiency, we need to have the crystal to have a thickness of about uh, 2 centimeters. But so, and we have already seen that the fast scintillators such as cerium bromide would be the appropriate choice. But unfortunately, these crystals are not available for such large dimensions. So instead, we have chosen sodium iodide scintillator as a uh, detector for this, which has having a faster decay time, uh, as much faster decay time as compared to uh, cesium iodide, which is at one microsecond, which is uh, this is having 25 to 50 nanoseconds. Uh, for the silicon PMs, we plan to use the on semi sensor uh, micro CCD silicon PMs. And for the readout, we plan to use uh, a application specific integrated circuit, which allows us to have uh, uh, by, from City Rock, uh, which is which allows us to have a simultaneous readout of uh, multiple uh, systems, multiple SIPMs together at very fast rates. So here is the mechanical configuration of the detector. Uh, so this is the full detector assembly, and here is the scintillator crystal and the quartz window, which will couple it to the silicon PMs, which are on this PCB. In the final configuration, the ASIC as well as the FPGA is also expected to be accommodated within the bottom side of this PCB. Uh, right now, we are only considering the silicon PMs here, and this is the entire thing is enclosed within an aluminum enclosure so that uh, it remains light tight because silicon PMs are sensitive to optical photons. Uh, now, uh, the overall block diagram of the detector readout is what is shown here. So as I mentioned, we plan to use the city rock ASICs. So the uh, cathodes of them will be uh, AC coupled to a, a discrete preamplifier and shaping amplifier chain, uh, which will be having a, a separate peak detector and ADC for the energy measurement of the events. While the anodes uh, individual chains will be connected to two city rock ASICs, which are having 32 channels each. And the ASIC includes the shaping amplifier uh, as well as uh, a peak holder and a MUX buffer output. So uh, now when we receive the trigger from the cathode, as well as from the anodes, the FPGA will control the ASIC to take out uh, uh, serially digitize uh, each uh, one of the each of these channels using an external ADC to get uh, the signal from each of these uh, 64 anode chains. Now uh, here is a photograph of the actual uh, fabricated uh, detector scintillator assembly. So this is the entrance window, where it's a, where it's a, which is a thin aluminum window, which is sufficient because as we are low energy requirement is only up, uh, up 100 kV. This is the bottom side where we have a quartz uh, crystal, which will be coupled to the uh, silicon PMs. Now, uh, the idea is to eventually use a city rock ASIC uh, with an independent FPGA readout system. But as a prototyping device, we plan to use uh, this evaluation board of the city rock ASIC, which is A1027 uh, readout board which uses a city rock ASIC, uh, which has its own FPGA and a microcontroller. Uh, so this allows us to uh, control, uh, set, set, do different settings of the ASIC through a uh, software uh, and also to read out the data from individual, uh, the individual SIPM channels, uh, either using an internal trigger or with an external trigger, such as from the common cathode as we require uh, in our application. 
So this uh, then the data can be so uh, for each event the data can be saved as a root objects root tree tree objects uh, on the computer which can be used then for further analysis uh, to do the position reconstruction and to evaluate the spatial performance of the instrument uh, spatial performance of the detector. So now uh, this is the current status of the development and the uh, in the immediate future we are uh, going to be doing the assembly and testing of this prototype detector where we have this readout with this ASIC evaluation board. Once we have this, we will be using this experimental data uh, with some uh, characterization, this experimental data and some GN simulations where we use the optical scintillation photons process or simulated inside GN to optimize the SIPM array configuration in the, detect, uh, in the scintillator. So the question is where do you place this uh, 64 SIPMs or 64 uh, uh, groups of SIPMs in the entire crystal? So that is one thing which we need to optimize. Uh, after this, we plan to have an uh, independent FPGA based readout control and we, uh, where we use the bare city rock ASIC uh, so that we, th this will be the flight like uh, usage. Uh, at, at present, uh, we are uh, the photon reposition reconstruction is done in computer where we read out all the signals from all SIPMs uh, and then uh, do the reconstruction on computer. But this will mean that we need to send for each event, we'll need to uh, send 64 or 70, whatever number of SIPMs in uh, data. To avoid this, we plan to implement some onboard algorithm for photon position reconstruction. This is something which we need to work on. And uh, in terms of the Daksha configuration, we also plan to do some optimization in the relative positioning of the high energy and the medium energy detectors so that we will have better efficiency for Compton imaging. So uh, I, I stop here. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mitun. Uh, it is a very interesting talk and a uh, very good development about this uh, detector's position detector for the DAXA mission because it is an advanced mission. So definitely the detector also is also used to be very advanced. And uh, okay, I will come to, back to you. And uh, first I want to listen from uh, my co here, Dr. Dorao. Any comments uh, first? Uh, no specific comments, sir. Nice development. Uh, all the best for the uh, completion of this one at the earliest. And uh, 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 that uh, related to the FPGA based control and uh, the readout uh, uh, using the CITROC as it no. So hmm. that one part, uh, what is the status or what is the? Uh... Okay, okay. So as a first step, actually now we are trying to use uh, this evaluation board, which has an inbuilt FPGA and a separate readout software to actually be able to do a SIPM readout. Actually, we have done already some tests with single SIPMs, but the full arrays we have to yet to do. After we do this, we can actually do a, a, our own uh, this one so that we have not yet started. Uh, we actually have just started the procurement of the bare ASIC separately to do that process. Okay. Start that. The first step will be with this uh, evaluation board. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dogaro and uh, Mitun. Uh, any one questions we can take up from the audience if any question is there? Okay. I think there is no questions and I don't see any question also in the chat box. So I have one uh, one point basically, uh, Mitun. So see, you have mentioned about this, uh, these actually sodium iodide kind of uh, crystals because of unavailability of the other ones. And uh, the sodium iodide is having a yield of uh, approximately around 38 photons per keV. Correct? Yes. So uh, what is happening is this DAXA is having the capability to be bridging the gap of the earlier detectors that you'll be having uh, detections from 100 keV to one MeV photon kind of things energy. So uh, my question is uh, when the 38 photons per keV, when dealing with this kind of one MeV, is there any dark, uh, your, this, uh, what is the dead time? Okay, the affecting because you are, you are actually uh, measuring the positions of the photons. So can you yeah. just uh, explain on this? Uh -huh. Okay, so, so yeah, so the, the, that, uh, that's a good question. So what happens is that actually when one in uh, the dead time will come when if suppose many X-ray photons are coming together and uh, hitting the detector at the same time, that probability is rather less because the flux is very, very low. But there also could be some dead time due to some particle interactions happening. But at the same time, let's say one optical, sorry, one X-ray photon of one MeV producing 38,000 uh, optical photons, that will not uh, cause a dead time because we will be reading out that within a very short duration. This will be produced within 250 nanoseconds and we will be only sampling within maybe even lesser than, uh, less duration than that. So that uh, will not add to the dead time. Uh, the only question is we have to, that's why I mentioned about the optimization of this configuration. We have to ensure that we are able to cover the dynamic range from 100 kV to 1 MeV with the readout system. So you have to yes. have the appropriate gain uh, so that uh, at 1 MeV it does not saturate uh, due to okay. this number of optical photons. Yes. Right. So that's yeah. something. That yes, yes, no problem. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Mitun. And one, uh, this, uh, one question has come from Dr. Avijit Deepak. Uh, the yeah. question is, uh, you also can read that the CS I SIPM dark count is shown as uh, 2800 nanometer on slide 10. 
flight number 10 is it over the uh, normal range so yeah, yeah so the, all the numbers are at uh, room temperatures so that that is the typical room temperature numbers of course if you cool down slightly it is on the this one so all the number that uh, both numbers what i showed was on uh, at room temperatures okay no problem yeah thank you thank you dr mithun this is a very nice presentation and uh, please thank you us. we have two more presentations okay so then we'll move to the next presenter uh, next presentation is on optical designs of the infrared spectroscopic imaging survey IRSIS satellite payload and it is from the dr satisha pure from kifr over to you <laughs> Yes, uh, am I audible to you? Yes, you are audible. Okay, okay. Uh, I will just upload my slides. Yes. Uh, you can see my screen now? Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, 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 okay, okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I am Satish S. Pujari from uh, Infrared Astronomy Group of TIFR Mumbai. Uh, I am here presenting the uh, our uh, ongoing development work of small satellite payload. I am especially describing the optical design part of this uh, small satellite payload. Uh, first, briefly, I'll tell you what is the activity of our group, uh, Mumbai TFR group. We are already active in balloon based far infrared astronomy as well as the ground based near infrared astronomy. From the balloon based astronomy, we are already doing the spectroscopy at far infrared wavelength of 158 micron wavelength. And from the ground-based astronomy, we are already doing spectroscopy as well as imaging from the ground-based telescopes. And now we are already in the development program of the small satellite payload also. So I am uh, describing the uh, our development work of this uh, satellite payload today. Uh, aim of this uh, pay payload is to do the spectroscopic survey at uh, near infrared and mid infrared wavelength range. Using uh, this is a small satellite, so the shortlist telescope is 30 centimeter in diameter, and its uh, field of view is 15 arc minute by 15 arc minute, and its angular resolution is 18 arc second. This will do the spectroscopic survey at two two bands. One is band is at 1.7 to 3.4 micron, other is the long wave band is 3.2 to 6.4 micron. The spectral resolution of this instrument is will be nearly 100. And this will have a fiber based fiber uh, integral field unit. And the integral field units that will divide the two dimensional uh, sky image into the one dimensional slit unit. And the, and the, and the number of fibers used in this uh, integral field unit is around 1000 fibers. And the detector used in this, uh, uh, this mission is 1024 into 1024 Mercury Academy Telluride that will operate at 80 Kelvin. The size of, since this is a size, uh, small satellite, so the size is limited roughly by uh, one meter cube uh, within this uh, dimension it has to fit. And the weight limit is maximum is around 50 kg. Here on the right side, I will show the just schematic of this entire mission. Light from the telescope falls on the focal plane and the, at the focal plane there is a micro lens array is placed and the, the micro lens array will fade the beam into the fiber optics. From the fiber optic will form a one dimensional slit uh, to the spectrograph and the spectrograph will either disperse the spectra of individual uh, this uh, sky field of view into the uh, detector. So the, this this instrument will do the spectroscopy of a 15 by 15 arc minute field of view means uh, multi, uh, 18 arc minute field of many fields it simultaneously means it is a multi object spectrograph whatever it comes in the 15 by 15 sky field of view it will get the spectra of the all the lights at a at a angular resolution of 18 arc second. So it will do the multiple uh, spect uh, object spectroscopy at the same time, simultaneous spectroscopy of multiple object at the same time. So why this mission is there? This is simple. Uh, uh, this name of the mission is IRCS. It is the Infrared Spectroscopy Imaging Survey. In short, we will call it a IRCS. So why we are using this IRCS? So actually this will cover the spectroscopic bag, which is left by the Hubble Space Telescope and the Spitzer. Means this is the, these two instruments not covered this two wavelength range. So this IR is, will cover the spectroscope survey at this wavelength. And uh, no survey type of is already exist at this wavelength. So this will cover the more than the 50% of the full sky within the two years of time and including the galactic plane. And the first time we are flying the fiber based integral filter into uh, this, uh, this uh, satellite plane. So actually, we are we already de demonstrated the laboratory model of this one. So this is the schematic uh, view of this payload. 
means log diagram of this payload. So this is will have the 30 centimeter telescope. Its F number is F by 12, and at the focal plane 87 integral field unit that converts the two dimensional image whatever form on the focal plane into the one dimensional slit unit. That slit is goes into the standard spectrograph, and the on the detector 87 the detector unit where we'll get the dispersal factor from the uh, from this spectrograph. So, so we already demonstrated only laboratory model. For the next, we have to go to the flight model and engineering model. The limitations of the laboratory model is the simplified version of the final model. So, the limitations of the laboratory model is only it is covering the 1.7 to 2.5 micron because we want to save the cost. So, it, so the detector whatever we had is sensitive up to 2.5 micron only. That is the mercury cadmium telluride detector, and the number of fibers we used 45 only to demonstrate in the single slit. Instead of 1000 fibers, we selected the 45 fibers only, and it is uh, using the grating also of the shelf grating. Other, I am uh, going by one by one to this uh, subsystem of this payload. So, first, I will go to the telescope part. So, we designed the telescope. This is the ZMAX model of the 30 centimeter telescope. This is the primary mirror, second mirror. Both are Ricci Christian uh, type of telescope, both are hyperbolic mirrors. And here is the folding mirror. Then it passes through this telecentric lens and the image, image plane is formed here. So these are the details of the telescope. And these are the SOLIDOX model of the telescope. And this is the actual fabricated model, primary mirror, secondary mirror. And uh, this is having the backside folding mirror. Then it goes into the two selectric lenses. It uh, image forms here. So this is uh, already done. This is we used for the laboratory model. And uh, this is the we is chosen for the all aluminium telescope. So means all aluminium telescope that is having a property that uh, it is uh, it not sensitive to the temperature. Means in the space environment we can't predict the exact temperature. If there is some plus minus temperature, then also it will maintain the image quality. That is the ben uh, advantage of the all aluminium telescopes. Mirror cell structure all are made of the same materials. We used the aluminium 6061 T6 material for this telescope. Uh, our uh, targeted operating temperature of for the telescope is 100 Kelvin, but uh, due to the space environment, there is a chance that, that that also may drift plus or minus away from that that one. As long as the all is uh, temperature of the telescope, entire telescope same, the all will aluminum telescope will uh, will not affect the image quality. So it will maintain its image quality. But what happens if the temperature gradient exists within the, along the length of the telescope? That one of the study study also made here. So in, uh, we seen that if the temperature gradient is exist along the length of the telescope, in case of all aluminium telescope, only three Kelvin of uh, temperature gradient is acceptable. In other case, we can make a, a structure of a low thermal coefficient of ex expansion material. In that case, we seen that up to seven Kelvin of uh, temperature gradient is acceptable along the length of the telescope because uh, we we think that the this uh, for the satellite, there is a background radiation from the earth also affect the uh, incident on this uh, along the lens. So maybe may the secondary part is maybe at a higher temperature and uh, this uh, primary part may be at a uh, lower temperature. Uh, based on that, we have studied these uh, possibilities. So these are the spots you can see. This is the actually spot on the image plane. Means bigger the spots means it is the degraded the image quality. And this uh, in that image plane, you can see that uh, black circle, that is the theoretical limit of the image quality. So in case of all aluminum telescope, we can say accept, uh, about 3 Kelvin of uh, gradient is acceptable along the length, but in case of low TC materials, the gradient is acceptable up to 7 Kelvin. But uh, in case of uh, uh, this low TC material telescope, but it is uh, fixed to that uh, reference temperature, from that reference temperature, 7 Kelvin is variable. But in terms of all aluminum telescopes, even it drifts to, from the reference away from also, then also there is up to 3K gradient is acceptable to uh, this telescope. So this is the study performed. This is the result of their study. But uh, we seen that most of the uh, satellite missions having the telescope of this size, mostly they used the all aluminum telescopes. So finally, we have to finalize which one is better based on the other radiation shielding, etc. We have to study that. So this is the for we made the for the laboratory model only, and we characterize this by imaging the CCD imaging of this telescope. We characterize this telescope, and the next part of this after the telescope uh, we made the integral field unit. That is, 
the integral function of the integral field unit is that this is the image plane. The whatever the two dimensional image formed on the focal plane of the telescope based on this fiber that will make the one dimensional slit unit to the spectrograph. Then we will uh, we can do the spectroscopy with the standard spectrograph. So this is the function of the integral field unit. The light from the telescope falls on the micro lens array. The micro lens array is uh, focuses the beam into the fiber core, and the other end of the fiber is connected to the spectrograph. So the then we are doing this uh, getting the spectra by the standard spectrograph. So after doing the telescope, we develop the integral field unit uh, with only 45 numbers of fibers. So this is the one of the custom made micro lens array and the single uh, lens slit here shown here. This is the having the size of 314 micron and uh, this is the 272 micron. This is very small uh, size uh, micro lens array, micro lens, uh, lens slits in the micro lens array. And uh, this uh, for each uh, lens slit is having the one fiber for, for that one. And the fiber we are using the this fiber. This is the fiber called IR guide one fiber. Its core diameter is 70 micron. And its uh, total diameter is 130 micron. So we have to align the each fiber to the single lens slit. So first we have to see this is also the fiber is very thin. It is a 130 micron. It is a hair thin fibers. And even these infrared fibers are is much delicate as compared to other, other optical fibers. So, so this is the actually the format of the integral field unit, final uh, integral field unit format. So at the focal plane, image is formed by the 15 by 15 arc minute image is formed here. Then half of this part is we are sending into the short wave band that is from 1.7 to 3.4 micron. And the fibers from the long wave band is half of this is long it sent to the uh, this uh, long wave band of the spectrometer. Means uh, finally we are having a 1000 fiber from the short wave band that forms the five parallel slits to the spectrograph and the 1000 fibers from the long wave band that forms the five parallel slits to the long wave spectrograph. Each each one one fiber, one one slit, this is on the how the uh, this dispersion looks on the detector. Suppose this is the one slit and this is the one fiber enters to the spectrograph. The dispersion of this on the detector you can see like this here. So detector also divided into five parts that one part is for, uh, for spectra of the one, one slit. So the second slit will form the this uh, spectra on the second part of the detector like this. This 1044104 detector you divided into five, five parts to get the spectra from the five slits. So total we have 1000 1, fibers in the long wave band and we'll get the spectra on the detector like this. So we are aiming for the first order spectra. So this is the format of the final integral field unit, but for the laboratory model, we have chosen only the 45 fibers from this focal plane uh, of the telescope. So we first developed the, that prototype of the integral field unit that is showing the worldly. Uh, see, this is the size of the focal plane, and we chosen the around 45 fibers within this focal plane from the central as well as the diagonal corner and the different position, and we made it a one. The one dimensional slit, what are the 45 fibers from the one dimensional slit here? The, in the, see, this is the whole is having one, 150 micron diameter, and the fiber diameter is 130 micron. 30 micron. And uh, we made this micro hole and then fiber into this one. That the we polished it from third. Yes, uh, Ted. This is LOC, uh, if you may kindly switch off the, the video of uh, the speaker, then bandwidth will be improved because there is an intermittent uh, Hello. vocal cut. Yeah, audio cut. Okay, uh, I, I, I can't no, see. No, no, actually, no, no. Problem is uh, because if you switch off the video, then bandwidth will be increased. So that I have requested. Uh, yeah, you can do also. Switch off. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. I have switched off the video. Yes. Now it is clear. Okay. You can see my uh, screen now. Yes. Yes. Uh, it is visible. Please go ahead. Mm. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. So this is the prototype completed integral field unit. It is uh, so. This is the when I 
eliminated the light from the slit and you can see this is the focal plane part is eliminated. When you eliminated this uh, focal plane and you can see the one dimensional slit on the other end of the integral field unit. So this is the completed uh, integral field unit with the 45 fibers. Uh, this after completing this, uh, yeah, uh, we have still not put the micro lens array onto that one. So this is only the fiber ends you can see. So then we align the micro lens array uh, to the uh, 45 fibers. This is the my single micro lens array kept on the uh, top of the, the fiber holding plate on the focal plane side. Then by the rotational translation mechanism, we align the micro lens array to the fiber holding plate. And the other end is the uh, here the one dimensional slit. That is seen through the to see, to see the CCD image. And we align the this uh, micro lens array and the fiber holding plate. This is the completed integral field unit. You can see the fibers here. This is the hair thin fibers. It is even transparent, so that's why we can't able to photograph also in very good way. This is transparent fibers. And here the focal plane end, and this is the one dimensional slit end. This is the completed. And these are the most of the parts, uh, the red parts you can see. This is the temporary parts made by from the 3D printed parts to hold this uh, entire unit together. Uh, next part of the, after the telescope and integral print unit, I will explain you the uh, spectrograph part. This is the laboratory model spectrograph. So the block diagram of the okay, block diagram of the spectrum is like this. This is the slit uh, from the light flow slit comes here and passes through the collimator unit, then passes through the grating unit. Then after the camera, the dispersed spectra will be seen on the detector. This is the block diagram, and here is the optical design of the laboratory model spectrograph. So this is the slit plane here. From the fiber, light enters into the spectrograph. After passing the three lens collimator, it collimated beam, it goes into the grating. After the dispersion, this passes through the four lens camera unit, and that we can see the dispersion on the detector unit. So uh, this is the spectrograph is designed for 100 Kelvin operating temperature. But while fabricating, we made it converted its uh, lens parameters into room temperature. Then we get uh, custom made these lenses. Yeah, the grating we used is the off-the-shelf grating. It is readily available grating used to demonstrate in the laboratory model. So these are the lenses we used in this spectra. Barium fluoride, SF57, these are the lens materials. And uh, this uh, grating is uh, substrate is fused silica. And these are the materials used in the spectra, lens materials. And the size of this, length of the spectrum is around uh, 500 mm length. And here the detector unit will come up. Here the H2RG detector that is cooled by the liquid nitrogen DVR. That is operating at 80 Kelvin. This is the completed mechan mechanical drawing of the uh, collimator part. Here are the three lenses here. This is the slit part, and this is the grating. This is the collimator plus grating unit, and this is the camera part. And uh, you, you can see this is the integrated into the uh, de detector holding the one. That is as the liquid nitrogen uh, into this. We can pour the liquid nitrogen into this one. Dr. Satisha, we are seeing yeah. the, the, the slide number 11. So which slide you are? Because uh, I, I am in 13. Oh, then uh, the, the, the slides is not changing. <laughs> OK, so, OK. Yeah. Oh, how to uh, one? How to... No, you may unshare and share it again, I think. Then we'll see. OK, OK. Unshare. Okay. Yeah, again, please share. Yeah, now I shared it. Uh, yes. Okay, now we can see the slides 11. Slide 11, yeah, we are seeing. Yes, yes, okay, okay. I will go to the next slide now. Yeah. Yes, yeah, now it is changing now. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So this is the spectrograph part. You can see that this is the slit entrance, means here the fibers are situated. And the, from the fiber, uh, this diverging beams come, passes through the collimator unit. Then it passes to the grating and the dispersed spectra after the grating passing through the camera unit and dispersed on the detector. So, and this is the actual optical design from the ZMAX of the laboratory model spectra. Uh, this is the fiber uh, uh, out, output from the fiber and passes through the three lens collimator, then passes to the grating unit. Then it, this is the four lens collimator, and you can see the detector here. This is the dispersed spectra on the detector. And these are the lens materials used barium fluoride, uh, SF57 barium fluoride, and fused silica is the substrate of the grating. And then SF57, fused silica, SF57, SF57 lenses. These are designed for the 100 Kelvin operating temperature. Then it is converted into room temperature uh, dimension to get the lenses are fabricated from the private vendor. 
this is the mechanical uh, drawing of the collimator unit solidrons model of the uh, collimator unit then this is the uh, camera unit and uh, here this is the actually detector unit detector with the liquid nitrogen dewar so this is cools the detector up to 80 kelvin temperature and this collimator unit is also fixed with the integrated into the detector dewar so it also goes to up to around uh, 100 kelvin temperature so this is the completed assembly of the uh, collimator unit and this is the completed assembly of the camera unit and this is the actually detector holding dewar as it is uh, uh, come to us so this is uh, the detector part here this is on the liquid nitrogen filling here and it is the cold finger that cools the detector unit and we re this is the existing uh, as it is received with the baffle so we removed this baffle part and we mounted uh, put our uh, camera unit integrated into this dewar system so along with the detector this uh, this part uh, camera part also goes to the close to the nitrogen temperature around 100 kelvin so detector cools around 80 kelvin so this is our test format we see actually finally we need to test this entire spectrum at 100 kelvin but for simplifying this we only integrated this camera part into the detector system that goes to 100 kelvin but this other part is at uh, kept at the room temperature only but still the, the, that's the, because of this room temperature there is some change in the parameters than this lens system so accordingly we adjusted the focal plane for this uh, collimator unit and we tested this uh, spectrograph uh, with the uh, camera unit at 100 kelvin and this part is at 2, 293 kelvin room temperature so this is the actual test setup of the spectrograph so this is the collimator and camera part and here is the integral field unit and this is the actual uh, uh, entrance to the integral field unit here instead of putting the beam from the telescope we put the simulated the beam f by 12 beam using the lenses f by 12 beam falling on the entrance of the integral field unit then after the micro lens and fiber it passes to the forms the enter, slit entrance to the collimator unit then we will get the passing through the after the camera unit we will get the spectrum on the detector actually this is the detector part which is the nitrogen dewar we can power the liquid nitrogen from here so we tested in this way using the source we used as the black body radiation source that we put and in front of that one we put a k filter so it allows only particular band that passing to the uh, this spectrogram so we tested the spectrograph in this way. So this is the outcome of the result of the spectrum on the detector unit. So this is two more minutes. Yes. Okay, yeah, okay. So this is the spectrum we received on the uh, detector unit. This is the zeroth order, first order, second order. And actually we are interested only in the first order. This is the dispersion. From each fiber you can see the dispersion, zeroth order, first order, second order, like this because this is the, not the off the shelf grating our interest is only the first order but because of this is the off the shelf grating that's why we are getting the light in the other order also. so this is the this cross section cut along the dispersion so here you can see the energy distribution on the uh, from this one and this is actually a zbex model see how the spectra we will get on the detector so this is exactly matching with the whatever we observed actually in the experiment you can see the first order zero third uh, second order and the third order so this is the actual whatever we've observed on the detector and this is the cmax model our targeted resolution is 100 but uh, we got the resolution up to 71 because we are not testing the condition exactly what it is designed for we are designed for 100k because uh, but we are uh, uh, testing the part of it is at uh, 290 kelvin that may be the reason and the grating also is the, not the uh, custom made it is the off the shelf grating so and our yeah after this we have the optical design of the final model also this is for the short wave band model means uh, optical design zmax optical design uh, from 1.7 to 3.4 micron and this is the long wave band optical design model the, this both are having the throughput of 28.4 percent and 36 to 9.9 percent but this is the throughput of only the spectrogram but uh, along with the telescope and integral unit, we are expected to get around 20 percent of the throughput for, for this uh, spectrographs and uh, whatever we achieved is telescope is designed and fabricated and uh, fiber optic based integral field is demonstrated with few fibers laboratory model spectrograph also demonstrated uh, 
laboratory model test report is submitted to the ISRO. Optical design of the flight model spectrograph is completed. So current test is we are awaiting for the design review from ISRO experts. The main IRC team, main team, uh, this is the scientist team, Professor Devendra Kriyoja and Professor Swarna Kanti Gosha so, till uh, September 2020 and uh, Professor Manoj Paravakara. And this is the engineering team from our group. Uh, thank you, yeah. Dr. Satisha, yeah. for this beautiful uh, presentation as well as the very good uh, development. Basically, I can see that this is like a sub uh, James Webb uh, telescope. Yes, because, it's in sport. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Because the wavelength range you are mentioning about two to six micron. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. So basically, it is just a, uh, like a James Webb uh, Space Telescope also has a wide range of this. And being an infrared uh, this yeah. telescope, we understand that your thermal management is very critical. Yes, yes, it is very challenging to get yes, the yes. operating temperature. Yeah. 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 So probably I think with with this indigenous development, uh, yeah. we'll actually complement the findings of the, the James Webb telescope also. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So once it is flown, and uh, uh, okay, uh, just one quick comment from my co-chair, uh, Dr. A. M. Durgarao. Yeah. On this presentation. Sir, sir, very, very good work, sir. Uh, all the best for your uh, uh, future uh, uh, work and uh, very quickly I think hopefully this will go at the earliest to, uh, to the yes. space yeah. and it will yeah. give new findings. Yeah, okay. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Durgarao. And we are running short of time. And uh, basically, uh, just uh, Dr. Satisha, one thing is basically you have mentioned about this kind of one meter by one meter by one meter uh, satellite yes. around 30 kg. And yeah. you have test, done testing with uh, liquid nitrogen. Uh, this yes, uh, yes, yes. the testing, uh, but yeah. the onboard how is the thermal management? Because you are you plan to actually maintain around 80, 100 uh, Kelvin kind of things, and uh, you yes, told yes, that yes. thermal gradients will be around uh, three Kelvin. Uh, that is the specifications. So that is what uh, and uh, that, uh, that, uh, what you have given a telescope around 100 yeah. to 110 Kelvin was there. So that can you just highlight on this aspect because the thermal management yeah. is very important. Yes, yes, that is very important. That can be managed by the uh, using this uh, passive cooling also may be possible that we need to explore that one by using the radiation shielders. Okay. We have to explore that one because. Yes. Uh, uh, otherwise, probably I think you will need to support from the, the, the spacecraft uh, uh, that is yes. thermal management. Uh, this yes, 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 yeah, yes, okay. yes. We need help from uh, ISRO. Yeah. Yeah, understood. Yeah, yes. yes. Thank you, Dr. Satisha, for this yes, very sir. nice yeah. uh, developmental indigenous work, basically. So yeah, it is yes. like a sub uh, James Webb telescope uh, contribution from the IFR team. So yes, please continue. And we have the last presentations and uh, yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. Thank yeah. you. We have the last presentation from Dr. Harsa A. Tanti from IITI. And um, I think uh, Dr. Harsa will be presenting on the directions of arrivals with orthogonally co-located dipole antenna for CMs. Over to you, Dr. Harsa. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, are you able to see my screen? Yeah, for entire screen is visible, so you may share uh, the uh, PPT. Uh, no, now? Yeah, it is in now. Please go ahead. So, uh, thank you, sir. Um, uh, myself, uh, Harsha Vinasanthi, and I am pursuing my PhD under the supervision of Dr. Abhul Dutta in, in the field of astronomy. So, uh, the topic of my today's presentation is the direction of arrival with the uh, Orthogonal co-located co dipole antenna for films, uh, which is uh, a issue funded project. So now here comes the outline of my presentation. So first, uh, first I will uh, go through what is uh, the importance of direction of arrival and uh, what is themes project, it, and then we, uh, I will discuss about the challenges in low frequency observations from space. And uh, uh, after that, I will. Uh, uh, show the DOI estimator which I am uh, working on and simulation results and there, uh, thereafter I will conclude my presentation. So coming to the uh, first topic that is what is direction of arrival. Direction of arrival simply means the uh, the, uh, the direction of the electromagnetic wave uh, which is where it is coming from. So it is very important to know the direction of the electromagnetic wave because we not, uh, in astronomy we want to study the sources. So to study the sources, uh, to study any source, we need to know the direction of the source. So in this context, we need to find the direction of uh, the uh, electromagnetic wave. 
So this can be done by two methods. Uh, we, the first one being the triangulation method where we use multiple telescopes uh, to find the direction of the source and another is using Golo polarimetric technique. Uh, now, uh, the uh, Golo polarimetric technique is a uh, instrument based technique where uh, where you have a few uh, antennas as, uh, and you uh, play around with electromagnetic equations to solve for the, uh, the direction of electromagnetic waves. So there are uh, previous uh, missions which demonstrated uh, the Golden Parameter Technique like Cassini Studio mission uh, where they have on board uh, two to three antennas uh, and uh, which is designed to uh, survey uh, uh, survey uh, magnetosphere and uh, uh, so, uh, do solar observations. So, uh, the, uh, coming to the themes project, the themes project is uh, uh, about a low frequency radio observ uh, radio observation uh, ranging from 300 kilohertz to 16 megahertz. So, uh, this, this project is done in two phases. The first phase will be uh, we are planning to deploy deploy it on fourth stage of the PSUV, where we will uh, 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 check the sensitivity of the uh, instrument uh, uh, due to interference of ionosphere. And also, uh, we will try to measure the uh, CMEs as uh, we will try to see the galactic spectrum uh, below 16 megahertz. And phase two, uh, we will uh, try to deploy a payload beyond, uh, deploy the payload to the far side of the moon where the RFI is very low, comparatively very low, and uh, uh, so that we can uh, see much more sensitive observations. So coming to the uh, challenges, is, uh, so this this is what uh, uh, drives us to look for uh, the direction of our arrival of the conical metric techniques. It's because uh, when we are uh, trying to do observation, Below uh, 16 megahertz, the ionos uh, due to ionospheric cutoffs, we can't uh, have a ground based station. So we need to go to space. And uh, if we go to space, if, uh, if we try to build an interferometer, there is uh, very uh, uh, high cost issue because we will have multiple uh, satellites and the synchronization between them will become a problem. And also, uh, we have to look for the uh, uh, effective way of designing an antenna because uh, for lower frequencies the lambda will become very large uh, and that will become a problem because the antenna dimension will increase for resonant antenna. So we are uh, so in this project we are trying to use a uh, active antenna where we have a monopole and uh, monopole or a dipole where uh, after that we will have a matching network which will match it to the uh, which will match the input and output impedance to the circuit it and uh, we will try to uh, do the uh, golip, use the golem parameter technique to find uh, the direction of the electromagnetic wave so now uh, the method which we are the underlying method behind the uh, estimation algorithm is uh, uh, proposed by karoji et al which we are building upon uh, which uh, which is summarized as uh, if we have a spectral, uh, uh, spectral density tensor uh, collected by three different orthogonal uh, uh, co-located co dipoles, uh, the co-located uh, means, means it is situated on the same uh, platform. So if we have a CubeSat, the entire CubeSat will have a three uh, orthogonal dipole arrangement, uh, arrangement. So if we have a co-located uh, uh, orthogonal dipole, so we will get a spectral uh, tensor, and the, the anti-symmetric part of that will, uh, uh, from that we can derive a pseudo vector, which will, uh, which will uh, tell us about the polarization and the direction of the electromagnetic wave. So uh, this is the overview of my simulator. So uh, what we have done is. We simulated a uh, uh, tri uh, dipole is, uh, using CST, and the voltage is output from uh, from that uh, we have used to uh, we fed to a DO estimated code, and uh, the, after that we estimated the direction of what is 
uh, the direction of the electromagnetic rays so this is the overview of the estimator so so uh, first we uh, take the voltage reading from the simulation uh, and uh, we will do uh, fourier transformation and then we uh, pass it through a, a matrix pencil method right? Uh, which is used for separate, separating different uh, frequency present uh, uh, present in the spectra, uh, and then uh, they, uh, we apply a least square method, uh, which is that we used to approx uh, approximate the joint amplitude and the phases uh, in the field vector, and after that we use the uh, pseudo vector formula to estimate uh, the spectral uh, means to estimate the direction of the direction of arrival. So these are the, this is the a uh, simple step uh, pointed uh, simple flow chart which points out how the estimation is taken place now uh, this uh, is the single frequency output for the dio estimator code so from here we can see that the uh, uh, if we see the snr signal to noise ratio the er error value reduces uh, drastically after uh, 40 db of snr snr so and uh, above above the, uh, and below that snr value the estimation is not so good and after the uh, and coming to the next slide this is uh, uh, the plot on the left is svr plot which is a uh, uh, singular value ratio so uh, it is a ratio uh, of uh, ratio of singular values obtained uh, from the uh, mpm method uh, uh, method to the maximum of the uh, maximum value of uh, value of the singular value which uh, de uh, which denotes the quality of uh, uh, quality of uh, uh, estimation means estimation of frequency is uh, so here we can see that uh, if we increase the number of incoherent frequencies say if uh, also if we have two three multiple sources uh, Reading at different frequencies is the uh, there is a, a degrade in the SVR uh, factor, uh, the degrade in the SVR factor, but uh, and uh, increase in SNR will improve the detection uh, uh, detection of the uh, estimated frequency. And the plot on the uh, right shows the uh, root mean square error uh, in relation to Uh, the SNR value. So, uh, root mean square error. Uh, we found out that the root mean square error uh, decreases drastically after the uh, uh, 60 dB of SNR. So, uh, coming to the uh, uh, conclu uh, conclusion part. So, uh, from this, uh, we got to know that the accuracy of this algorithm is pretty uh, uh, pretty good. Uh, and SVR factor I means uh, from SVR factor and RMS error, uh, error also we got the SNR uh, SNR uh, with respect to SNR it is very good and accurate. But we, we also no noted that the accuracy decreases drastically when uh, the number of incoherent sources increases, as well as uh, 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 as well as uh, when you uh, account for a certain uh, uh, so accuracy of the uh, estimator decreases when the incoherent uh, sources are increased and also the the uh, when you introduce a non, a non a coherent sources so in in case of coherent sources the algorithm uh, fails so the Uh, currently we are working on to find how to distinguish between coherent sources and and uh, how to reduce the error introduced uh, by the uh, increase in coherent sources so uh, also uh, we also computed the comp uh, computation complexity of the algorithm so we found out that it is uh, very uh, it is very low comp uh, low computational uh, It has very low computational complex complexity uh, with, when compared to algorithms like uh, music, uh, MP music, and ESP right, which are already being used. Just and uh, and uh, we also need to account for the the uh, the uh, space uh, for space based application that 
uh, in case of re uh, rotation revolution of the satellite and multiple means um, revolution of satellite how the, the estimation will uh, change so these are the references and um, thank you thank you dr harsha air tanti uh, for your uh, basically the, the theoretical work come uh, this um, instrumental sensor deployment kind of things on the direction of the arrivals with orthogonally co-located dipole antennas uh, for sims basically is a very interesting work and a very complex uh, mathematical formulation is involved to be understand and moreover as you told that uh, for, uh, with more in coherent sources with the same magnitude the, the sensitivity the accuracy of this detection is a concern so, uh, so yeah. probably i think you will improve uh, with uh, time and um, i would like to hear a quick comment from my co-chair dr am durgarao over to you Dora. yeah uh, here a small uh, uh, interesting question i want to ask because your uh, frequency observations are basically from 30 kilohertz to 16 megahertz uh, yeah. because in this area as you told rightly told it's uh, antenna size is very complex and very large antennas only will be going so you will be going for a uh, short dipole type of thing or monopole uh, your uh, detour what type of any preliminary design has been uh, you have carried out? Uh, what type of length uh, you are uh, going to use? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, the design is going on parallel to it. And uh, the first phase is almost uh, near completion. And we are on the prototyping stage. Uh, the length of the dipole we are selecting is between 1.5 to 3 meter. And uh, what type of uh, mechanism you will be using for the uh, antenna matching? Because the broadband uh, matching will be there here. 60, almost like 60 megahertz uh, for a dipole is a difficult task. Yeah, uh, that is a difficult task. So we are uh, using. Uh, uh, I actually don't know the much details about it, but we are uh, using uh, op uh, amp based circuit to match, uh, match the antenna where we have, uh, we consider to, uh, we take uh, input of the two antennas and uh, pass it through a transformer and couple it uh, to the op-amp where we, uh, which is uh, operating in the differential mode and which gives output uh, in, uh, out voltage as output. So, so when you design uh, one more suggestions because uh, when multiple sources are there so taking out because basically uh, coherent source is there it is e relatively easy uh, when multiple sources are there so designing the electronics will be uh, you have to take much more uh, careful when you are uh, selecting the particular source and you are rejecting the other sources and characterizing the sources all the best for your future work thank you thank you Thank you, Dr. Durgaro, for your uh, valuable comment on this uh, activity on the direction of the arrivals of this orthogonally co-located dipole antennas. And then since we are running short of time, uh, uh, we'll let us check whether any one, two questions we can take up from the chat box. Also, there is no question, so no issues. Then uh, let us thank the speaker, um, Dr. Harsha Tanti, for this work. And uh, we understand that um, the, the, this uh, one day, this um, uh, development activity will actually reach the maturity level and we will to detect uh, the directions of this electromagnetic force from the uh, astronomical object. So then let us, with this, we are concluding the session A of this PS5 day four. We had uh, very good presentations from the all the presenters. Only one presenter was absent that uh, Dr. Jaya Krishnan Mecca from PRL. So it was a plus presentations, but otherwise all the presenters have come and they maintain the time and given very good presentations. And I would like to thank my co-chair, Dr. M. Dorgar also for uh, uh, patiently actually the, the following the presentations and for his valuable comments. And now we'll be moving to the uh, next uh, session. So the, before we conclude the formally, Dr. M. Dorgar, you have any comments uh, for this uh, session A? Uh, not much, a very interesting session. And initially, we had a very good talk by Dr. P. Ganesh from uh, IPRC uh, on ISRU. And uh, after that, we have seen uh, very nice uh, talks, uh, uh, flash presentations, and uh, other uh, uh, wide diversified uh, talks from uh, other uh, presenters. All the best for the, all the presenters and uh, for their future work. And uh, I'm thanking uh, uh, my chair, uh, Dr. Indra Gusar, 